something at Roger. Oh, okay. I like that. I was just say DN, but maybe should I say what I don't When you get older, your eyes, uh, your eyes flatten. Okay. Your, 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 your eyes, your corners actually flatten as you okay. get older, which takes away the vision. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The Board of Education, Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District, returns to public session. We called this meeting to order this afternoon at 4.40 p.m. and we entered into closed session. We have three settlements to report out of our closed session and I'll read those in order. The first is DN 1014-18-19. The Board of Education enters into an alternative dispute resolution agreement as follows. The district will contract with K&M School for the second semester of 2018-19 in an amount not to exceed $44,590. There were six members of the Board of Education voting and all six members voted in the affirmative. The next item to be reported out is an existing litigation OAH case, and the number is 201-805-0306. The Board of Education approved the settlement as follows. One, within 60 days of decision, the district, is order, the district order is to pay mother the sum of $6,669.89 for out-of-pocket travel. Two, Within 60 days of decision, the district is ordered to re reimburse, is ordered to reimburse mother for the student's monthly tuition at Heritage Academy for the period of September 2018 through June 2019 in an amount not to exceed $10,407 per month. Three, the district is ordered to reimburse mother for out-of-pocket educationally related travel expenses for the period of September 2018 through June 2019. Lastly, four, within 60 days, the district is ordered to pay mother the sum of $620 for travel incurred in August 2018 for a mandatory parent conference at Heritage in Utah. There were six members of the Board of Education voting. All six members voted in the affirmative. The last item to report out this evening is DN 1009-18-19. The Board of Education approved the settlement as follows. One, the district will reimburse the parents with an amount not to exceed $92,000 for private educational services provided to the student at Fusion Academy between May 1st, 2018 through and including June 30, 2020 in two equal amounts not to exceed $46,000. Payments to parents shall be made by June 28, 2019 and July 26, 2020. Secondly and lastly, the district shall pay reasonable and compensable attorney's fees to hope for families in an amount not to exceed $22,500. Said payment shall be made to hope for families within 45 business business days of agreement. Receipt to district by March 1, 2019. At the time, five members were voting and all five members present um, voted in the affirmative. At that time, um, member Oscar De La Torre had not yet arrived to the meeting. And the other two that I spoke where I said six members were voting, it's all six who are currently on the dais 
and Maria Leon Vasquez is absent, we do expect her to join us later in this meeting. That now brings us to the roll call. Again, you'll see that six members are here. This is now also the Pledge of Allegiance. And Ms. Afshar, would you lead us this evening, please? Thank you, Ms. Afshar. Welcome. We have the approval of the agenda before us. Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? Thank you, Oscar. Moved by Oscar, seconded by Lori. All those in favor say aye, please. Aye. And that's been approved unanimously. Friends, we have one set of minutes to approve this evening. Those are our minutes from the February 7th meeting. Are there any changes that need to be made? Okay, Craig has moved those minutes. Is there a second? Thank you, Oscar, seconded by Oscar. All those in favor say aye. And that is unanimously approved. This now brings us to our commendations and recognitions for the evening. Our first item here is for Black History Month and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s celebration. Dr. Drati. I would like to invite up Dr. Jacqueline Mora uh, to um, invite our guests who will speak about uh, the Black History Month. Good evening. I would like to introduce um, Dr. Sean Arce, who will be facilitating this, this portion of the, of the commendation. Thank you, Dr. Mora. Uh, President uh, Dr. Tavildjian Jeswin, members of the governing board, it's a pleasure and honor to uh, present with you and update uh, some of our work in integrating the social justice standards. Um, specifically, we're going to be looking at our ethnic studies course at Samo High. I think it is, um, I know it is exemplary in terms of integrating uh, these very critical uh, social justice standards. If we could go to the next uh, slide. Oh, we have it? I'm sorry. I have it. I'm so sorry. So, just to give us an overview, um, I'm going to. We're looking at the overall objectives uh, a, to deepen a knowledge and a historical understanding of traditionally marginalized groups in the United States, uh, particularly for uh, people of color in the United States. The development of critical literacies that inform uh, our students' analyses of uh, power and oppression. And then uh, the, uh, very much in alignment with the action component of the social justice standards, is the, the actual working in partnership with communities, uh, with communities that our students come from to actually improve the conditions uh, through collective action. <clears throat> the major themes in our ethnic studies class, uh, this is actually our scope. There's four major themes. Uh, developing our cr critical analysis, race, class, gender, and power. Um, whose history, our histories, so filling in those gaps that have been unfortunately erased or that are too often ignored within a traditional uh, U.S. history narrative that is critically important. Uh, youth voice is something, uh, our third theme of study, I would call it, and how we uh, develop the necessary skills within our students, uh, a co-construction, if you will, of developing those necessary skills and uh, literacies in order for them to assert their voice on issues that are relevant and uh, pressing in our community. And then our fourth uh, major theme is our youth participatory action research project, where students engage, I believe I spoke about this at previous meetings, and uh, our, my colleague Sarah Rodriguez also spoke at link to it, is where students identify issues in the community, they go through a problematization process or a critical praxis process, where they identify, again, problems in our community, research those problems uh, very much in a graduate level sense, uh, come up with solutions to those problems, and then kind of reevaluate the whole process. <clears throat> I'm gonna give us a, a, a breadth, a look at the breadth of our ethnic studies, our ethnic studies scope and sequence. Uh, we refer to them, the language in the district as curriculum maps, also known as a scope and sequence in our standards alignment. Um, 
<clears throat> this standards alignment will allow students to go through uh, our high schools uh, and uh, meet the 2024 uh, American Cultures Ethnic Studies requirement. We have our social justice standards looking at the domains, the four uh, domains of identity, diversity, justice, and action. We have uh, more specific grade level domains. Uh, these are broken into uh, K through two, three through five, six through eight, and for uh, purposes of our ethnic studies high school course, obviously nine through 12, and I gave an example of, uh, and I think it's important to note there, I have a positive view of myself, including an awareness and of and comfort with my membership in multiple groups in society. And this is very much in alignment with the uh, spirit and some of the basic tenets of ethnic studies, and that is developing a positive image of, of self and community. Our, et our American culture's ethnic studies requirements, uh, we need to address each three of these uh, uh, guidelines that are laid out uh, by UC Berkeley. Uh, does the course address theoretical and analytical issues relevant to the understanding of race, class, gender, culture, and ethnicity? Is the course integrative and comparative uh, within the larger context of American history, culture, economy, or environment? And then are we taking into account uh, the following groups, the groups that have been historically marginalized and erased and often too forgotten in the U.S. historical narrative. And uh, we take in at least three of those perspectives. Are we addressing their experiences, uh, African-American, Asian-American, Chicanx, Latinx, Indigenous, and European-Americans? And then lastly, our Common Core state standards. Uh, being that uh, this fulfills the G requirement, the Ethnic Studies course, uh, we are addressing the English language arts and literacy and history and social studies. So that is kind of the, that is uh, a, an overview uh, of, of the breadth of the course and how it actually meets uh, those standards and how it will fulfill our 2024 uh, American Cultures Ethnic Studies graduation requirement. Going down, narrowing down to give us a, uh, a more specificity we're looking at uh, units of study. So this un particular unit of study, Loteria Feminist Revisions, we're looking at it, uh, it's within the scope and sequence and fits under the theme of race, class, gender, and power. Lesson one, uh, toward a feminist woman of color, critical consciousness. Some of the readings that we're looking at, uh, some of us are familiar with these, Gloria Ansaldua, Angela Davis, and Paulo Freire. Freddy talks, uh, speaks to this uh, notion and this concept of a critical consciousness. Our social justice standard alignment, identity, diversity, justice. Uh, and of course, with those grade level outcomes that I spoke to earlier. And then within our American cultures, ethnic studies alignment, we're looking at uh, theoretical, conceptual understandings. Again, the integrative and comparative uh, with, uh, relative to US history. We're looking at the groups addressed, Chicanx, Latinx, African-American, and Euro-American. Under our, our Common Core State Standards, we're, again, we're looking at those various standards under our English Language Arts and Literacy uh, for History and Social Studies. Instructional procedures, we have the students read these. <coughs> these uh, really tough, they have, really have to grapple with them. They're, uh, they're academically rigorous, uh, yet at the same time, they are very relevant to the lives of, of the students that we serve and that we're teaching. Uh, we have students group up, uh, identify salient points from those three pieces of literature, write them on post steps, and then do a share out at the end of the class. They present their, um, their findings with, the, with the, uh, the entire class. And, and it's important to note also about this is uh, students are actually developing those critical and necessary literacies that are needed uh, to become uh, socially just and academically capable students. Uh, they're developing those reading skills, those analytical skills, those writing skills, and uh, the speaking, the speaking skills. Um, going on uh, skipping, there's, there's seven lessons within this Loteria Feminist Revision. So I'm going to skip to lesson three to give us uh, uh, an example. Loteria, the lesson three is Loteria Feminist Revisions. Again, uh, we're addressing those uh, three social justice standards. We're, again, we're addressing the American Cultures Ethnic Studies Alignment and then the, California, uh, the C Common Core uh, State Standards. So some of the procedures that are important to note, uh, we're going to be looking at reviewing and discussing 
traditional and revisionist Loteria cards. Just to give us an example, well, what are Loteria cards? Uh, a, commonly cult a common cultural practice within the Latino community is, are these Loteria cards. And so uh, for our Latino students, it serves as a mirror, uh, a validation of their experiences. For our non-Latino students, it serves as a window of, uh, into uh, the cultural nuances, the cultural practices of the Latino community. Uh, Students are actually creating a Loteria card of their own. Important to note, uh, using a cultural icon uh, that is culturally empowering, but at the same time also counters negative stereotypes or negative imagery of women of color. Um, a highlight, uh, a good majority of the, of the students in the Ethics Studies course at Samuel High are young women of color. So. We obviously adapt our curriculum to meet their, their holistic needs, their academic needs, their social emotional needs, their, uh, uh, their needs as a whole. Um, and then we have them, so the, the, the creative part, the intentional part of actually drawing a Loteria card, which we'll see in a minute, but accompanying that are the nece necessary critical uh, literacies of writing. So they're gonna choose, they're gonna write a one page single space narrative of the Loteria card that they chose to create. So they have to describe the Loteria card. They have to describe why they chose that particular icon. Uh, they have to describe how the Loteria car card is culturally empowering and counters negative imagery of women of color. And then also, uh, how does this Lot Loteria card develop uh, a, a woman, women of color critical consciousness? I'm gonna stop there and, and note uh, a critical consciousness, according to Freire, there's three levels. There's a magical consciousness, there's a naive consciousness, and then there's a critical consciousness. So we define these, we read about them within Freire's uh, uh, piece of literature, and we discuss them. Um, the magical piece is, uh, you know, we, we look at uh, issues in our society, societal ills. So a magical piece would actually say, well, this is God's will, the reason why certain communities of color are have higher incarceration rates or lower educational attainment is because it's God, God's will. A naive consciousness would say, um, well, you know, it's the culture in the community. The community has a particular cultural deficit. And then where a critical consciousness would come and say, well, let's look at the structures that actually create inequality, uh, such as um, any institution within our society. So our examination of traditional Loteria cards, these are uh, two in particular. Some of us may be familiar with these. Uh, La Dama, so it's a, it's a, it's a woman uh, dressed in a particular way. And then El Valiente. So it's kind of a, a, a macho representation with the, you know, violent, with a knife, uh, etc. So then we look at some revisionists that our professional artists are, are, are looking at. And so you have, uh, Juxtaposed to uh, La Dama, you have La Feminist, and you have, uh, instead of El Valiente, you have La Valiente. So they're countering uh, negative uh, images, but they're also countering uh, <coughs> gender norms or, or, or gender uh, expectations of what uh, uh, womanhood should be. And then lastly, the really exciting part about this is, is the product in the, in the work that students had created. Uh, this one is, as you see there, La Self Love, and it speaks to uh, body image and body normativity and how that um, disproportionately and, and, and in a real specific way impacts uh, young women of color. And then another one a student did was La Activista. Again, uh, really breaking some of the gem gender normativity and expectations that are, uh, that are placed upon young women of color. So a piece of the student narrative for La Self Love, it shows how, demonstrates how uh, students make these critical connections, which are called for, not only in the social justice standards, but our American culture's ethnic studies. These conceptual connections that students are making. So we ask students to draw from those three pieces of literature that we spoke to earlier. So I'm gonna go ahead and read this and honor uh, our students. La Self Love is about breaking body image normativity which is based upon a supposed or imaginary white and middle class standard, <clears throat> which in many ways is oppressive to all women. As a black woman, I draw from and am in, and inspired by Angela Davis, who asserts the black woman has historically been 
the target of sexual violence, the object of hypersexualization. We must take back our very bodies as agentive historical subjects and embody self-love. So that's just a little clip of uh, this young woman's uh, one-page narrative. And you see the academic uh, rigor in this in, in that she's drawing from the literature. She's citing the literature to really solidify her positionality on this certain subject. Student narrative number two, uh, this young uh, Chicana draws from Gloria Ansaldúa. Uh, Poder, la activista, counters traditional gender expectations and norms, representing la Chicana as assertive, strong, and intelligent. It dispels the many myths about Latina women as being docile, apolitical, and apathetic. My utilization of Dolores Huerta, the epitome of la activista, for my Loteria card is empowering for me as a mujer in that it represents what, what Ansaldúa states as the counter stance, which refutes the dominant culture's views and beliefs. And for this, it is proudly defiant. All reaction is limited by and dependent upon, and dependent on what is re, it is reacting against. Because the counter stance stems from a problem with authority, outer as well as inner, it's a step towards liberation from cultural domination. So you see um, a snapshot of the process. Um, really important again to look back upon is the addressing of our social justice standards, our American cultures ethic study standards, and equally important is our common core state standards for um, language arts and addressing history and social studies. So that is a, a, a snapshot of, of something that we are uh, currently uh, finalizing in terms of our scope and sequence, our curriculum maps. It's coming together really nice. Um, very dynamic class, dynamic teacher, exceptional students who are really grasping these uh, higher order, rigorous uh, conceptual um, frames, if you will, in, um, in demonstrating their understanding and their place in the world. This particular one has a, has a real emphasis on the social justice standard of identity. And I believe that is it. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Arce. Oscar. Um, first, off, first off, I wanna just uh, acknowledge the uh, incredible work that this represents. Um, when I was a student at Santa Monica High School, I never had anything similar to this. And um, it took me, you know, for me to get to college, you know, to take, to get this type of information, you know, this really uh, in-depth uh, critical thinking. Um, so it's, uh, it's great that students are, are, are um, having access to this type of coursework and, and this type of uh, reflection uh, and education um, at the high school level. Um, so it's just, I just want to acknowledge the great work that you all are doing because this is, uh, pretty amazing. I mean, just to see the student, uh, the student work product is, is inspiring to me. Um, at first, I, when I read it, I thought it was like some professor wrote mm -hmm. this piece. And then when you tell me this is what our students are writing, I was, I was blown away. So it's just amazing to hear that our students are, are, are taking in this information and producing this type of work. Um, in terms of the, um, how, how, many, how, how many course sections do we have right now at Santa Monica? Is it just, and this is only being taught right now at one high school, or do we have uh, curriculum uh, like this at, at, at any other school outside of Santa Monica High? Mm -hmm. Sure, please, Dr. Moore. So um, we, we want to remember that what we're doing at this point and we're showcasing is the work that our, t that our teachers are engaging in with the social justice cohorts, co whether that be cohort one, cohort two for Santa Monica, and now cohort one for Malibu. So our, st our teachers are developing these lessons. Uh, today you were able to see an example of one of our teachers yearly scope and sequence and then unit. So we are in the development of all of these particular courses. We do have our ethnic studies courses that are currently in place, but we are definitely continuing to work on the integration of the social justice standards across multiple courses so that we can be able to come in and showcase the scope and sequence along with the units. So I don't have um, those numbers with me, but I can definitely um, share with you what, those, what the courses are that we're currently offering at Santa Monica and at Malibu in regards to just ethnic studies. But again, remember that our work has been, how do we integrate 
the social justice standards across multiple courses so that it's not just dependent on mm. one class, but it's, it could be fulfilled by multiple classes. So this is one example of one of our, te uh, our teachers' work towards that goal of having a menu of courses for 2024. Great. So that, yeah, so that answers uh, my, my questions because I know uh, mm -hmm. this board approved a, a mandatory graduation requirement mm -hmm. for 2024, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so um, at some point, I guess, when you come back, you'll, you'll be able to let us know, you know, how we will be able to meet that requirement. Yeah, so the intention is for us to be able to come back to you later on in the year with um, a few courses to move forward for this year and building off every year. We, we, as I mentioned, we do have that cohort one that started last year and in March we'll be engaging in this work for a full year. Then we have a second one that started and then one that started in Malibu. We have teachers that are in different places around their development of lessons, units, and the year scope, but that is the direction that we're moving in. So we're excited to be able to come back to you later on in the year. Just as someone who, yes. who has fought many years, you know, mm -hmm. on this board and in this community to ensure that we had courses such as these ethnic studies and American studies and um, uh, and now with the social justice standards, it's just it's just very. I mean, it's a very proud moment for me as a product of the school district to to hear that um, students are are just experiencing this type of curriculum and to see themselves in the curriculum. So thank you for your work. No, of course, and definitely our teachers' hard work in engaging in this work and reflecting on their own practice. So I do want to recognize our teachers' efforts, um, Dr. Arce's support of well, as well as this process, and our students in their openness and willingness to, to share their work and to engage in this type of dialogue. Thank you, Oscar. Are there other questions for Dr. Arce? John. All right. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Oscar. This is a great presentation of what's happening with our uh, with ethnic studies and social justice. It's framed in the agenda as a Black History Month and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. So, I think I think we should, if we want to do a report on on on, on social justice and ethnic studies, I think that's a great idea. This is really useful, but I think we missed a chance to actually honor the agenda item and honor the legacy of it, it, one of, I mean, to me, one of the most impactful figures of the second half of the 20th century. So I at least would like to mention the name Dr. Martin Luther King um, in public. So um, now I'm going to step right back into it with you. Um, I was listening to NPR, actually. I can't remember. I, my days just blend together, which I'm sure for all of us, because uh, all of us do so much work. but. I, think, I can't remember if it was KPCC or KCRW, and there was a story there this morning or yesterday morning and uh, focusing on um, Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. It was a really great piece. But something that was addressed there is that if injustice exists anywhere, that, right, what's the, the, help me with the line, it's the, the quote. Thank you, and so I think about, and then, and then just yesterday, it was a Wednesday, right? Yes, yeah, so yesterday I was teaching, and I told my students about this particular article I read in The Atlantic about standing on the shoulders of a king. And I said, do you all know what that means? And I had to kind of carry them along and talk about um, all of us, whether we be black or not, um, who are committed to justice and egalitarian principles, are uh, fortunate to live in the wake of Dr. King's work. And I see what Dr. Arce presented and what's happening in our classroom as curricular work, academic work, that could not have happened had it not been for Dr. King or many others. Uh, we, we know this, that these are a cohort of people. Strike that word. That sounds like we talk about cohorts. <laughs> these, were, these were warriors for justice, speak of June Jordan, and blazing a trail. And I think it's really wonderful that we can focus on the work that we're doing to contribute to the legacy. And so the only thing I think was missing here was our tethering to and touching to that legacy. Um, I made those connections, but as we're all teachers here, right, many of us, so we'll just touch that and say that we're all standing on the shoulders of a king, and this work that's happening in our district, after so many years of hoping for things like the social justice learning standard and what's coming as a graduation requirement, reflect a changed political sensibility um, that many of us hold. So thank you very much. Most definitely. Thank you, Dr. Arce. Keep up the good work, I think, is what we all want to say. I, Oscar. I mean, it, it, in reflection and, and, and 
you know, my apologies for tagging on to, because I think the, the presentation was, we could have been over right now, but I, I, I want to say something, though, because it reminds me. Um, you know, Martin Luther King fought for a law that's called the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I, some would argue that it was probably one of the most important pieces of legislation that empowered blacks in the South. Um, tonight at the city council meeting here in our own community, um, there's a challenge to the California Voting Rights Act. And this is an issue that is, is coming forward. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that if not for the work, is what you said, you know, if not for the work of Martin Luther King, we wouldn't have the California Voting Rights Act. There's a connection here in Santa Monica today. It's a historic moment tonight um, that goes all the way back to the Civil Rights Movement. And so I, I want I, you know, as you were speaking, and, and, and I'm glad John brought it up, because it is important for us as a board, you know, to model that, that connection, you know, to talk about that, to, to be open about, um, you know, social justice is not something that's always very comfortable. And I know, I know many of us can feel certain ways about what's happening in Santa Monica right now. I just wanted to, not to, not to say what's, uh, you know, that it's wrong or, or, or right, but just to acknowledge that if not for the work of the Civil Rights Movement and many people that, that died, I mean, people paid a price. And of course, you know, one of the most important heroes of that movement was uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, we would not have an opportunity to even contemplate um, voting rights issues in the city of Santa Monica. So I, I, I wanted to acknowledge that, and, I, and hopefully we can, with that, honor a little bit more about what John was saying, because I think it is true that we, we, we named it a certain way, we brought in some concepts where, which I think are very important, but it was important also to acknowledge Martin Luther King's work, so thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Arce. Thank you. And we'll now move on and Excellent. do a little uh, handshake for everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Dreddy, that brings us now to, we do the, uh, there you go, there you go. I call them the jazz hands, I don't know what they're technically called. Uh, uh, we're now moving to item 4B, which is also a commendation. It's Career Technical Education Month. Dr. Mora, I see, is making her way back to the podium. So good evening. At this point, I would love to introduce our Learning and Innovation Coordinator, Dr. Devon Smith, who will be facilitating this commendation. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Good evening, board. And. Uh, Dr. Drotti and Cabinet. Uh, very, very proud and excited to be standing here uh, with amazingly talented students from Santa Monica High School and also amazingly talented instructors in our CTE program. And um, so this is in celebration of Career Technical Education Month. And um, I wanted to introduce a few people so that they can share uh, some of the great work that's going on at Santa Monica High School. So. First of all, I want to make us aware there are six programs in career technical education in automotive, dance, business marketing, photography, graphic design, and also film production. And um, I wanted to make uh, aware, uh, everyone, we have Ms. Green from dance, we have Ms. Kemp from business marketing, and Mr. Ledford, oh, <laughs> photographer, um, <laughs> doing his thing, paparazzi. Uh, uh, from, from photography. So, first I want to start off by introducing Miss Green, who will uh, share a little bit about what's happening in dance. Good evening. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak about my program. Can we start with the video, please? There it is. 
Yes, that video just tugs at my heartstrings every time that I see it. Um, that was a video that we did for our spring show last year. Um, and it just tugs at my heart because my students just work so, so very hard to get to that point. Um, we rehearse in class and we do a little bit of after school. Um, but I'd love to tell you about my program. So if we can go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so the dance program is actually for students to learn to dance or continue dancing. I do get students that have some technical training from outside studios or different programs. In class, I teach jazz, hip hop, ballet, modern, social dances, as well as cultural. Um, we work on dance technique and performance skills. They condition and warm up and strengthen their muscles pretty much every day to get ready for the show or any performances. Um, it builds on their self-esteem, their self-confidence. I truly believe that it allows them to get involved on campus and find a sense of belonging and make plenty of friends. Um, the dance program is a great alternative to PE as well as um, visual and performing arts. They can earn credits for community college, UC schools, as well as Cal States. Um, the opportunity for ninth graders is through their general PE class. They spend about a week with me learning a routine. Um, and they only need to be enrolled in general PE in order to get introduced to the dance program. And then there are the three levels. They move from level one, two, or three, depending on the grade and the um, credits or the curriculum that they're looking for. Um, the title for level one, I'm, I'm moving more towards PE dance, where I'm actually incorporating some of the skills that they learned their ninth grade year and having that into their 10th grade year through the intro or the novice level. Um, and they just need to sign up with the advisor to get enrolled in that, in that class. For level two and three, they are required to audition. Um, auditions take place in the spring semester. Um, it's promoted and I bring in a panel of judges as well as teacher recommendations and I look at grading and um, just a few other different criteria for their application. Um, and then level two is considered our, like JV junior varsity dance program so that it's almost correlating with sports. Um, and then level three is for varsity dance or performance team. Some of the dance highlights that we've done, I wore my shirt because we did a staff lip sync battle and I had to get up there and perform. Um, and my students helped me win and it was about 100 of us performing and we did so good. Um, and we also did our a winter dance concert this past December. We have our spring showcase coming up. It is Disney themed, so I will be making sure that you get some information to come out and hopefully support our show. Um, we're also doing a dance workshop next week with SMC. We have some dance faculty coming over and they teach usually two different styles. Um, this year they're gonna be offering African as well as ballet. Um, and then in March, we're gonna be traveling to AMDA, Performing Arts Conservatory in Hollywood, where students will get to take class with some industry professionals. Um, I put in for us to go to dance camp where I'm taking our varsity dance team um, for a few days to just do some team bonding learn some choreography and really start the school year off to a great start. Um, and then I also introduce um, guest choreographers and industry professionals to my students throughout the semester and the year. And so that's Samo Dance, thank you. And I'd like to introduce to you Yulia, who is a student in graphic design. Uh, hello, my name is Yulia Simonova and I'm one of the students from the graphic design program. Uh, most of the time on the graphic design we do such things as the posters uh, for our clubs and uh, other events in the school. Uh, the people, uh, some teachers from, or from administration or even the students could came to our class and ask for the poster, logo or anything what including the graphics uh, to our class and we will produce it to them in the, like one week. Most of the time we spend like three days to make one thing and it was the last poster for one of the uh, contests what our teachers find out for us. Uh, we, we also make some posters for the clubs and events I already said. Uh, our students also should to find out some projects what just looking around the school what we can developing and make it better. For example, the Crocs Club, they, it's very difficult to make the Crocs look beautiful. <laughs> and, uh, so they, the Crocs clubs ask us to find out the way how to do it and we do the best what we could. Uh, some, uh, sometimes we also did the logos again for the clubs most of the time. Uh, most, we 
for the logos we use the Adobe Illustrator and for the posters most of the time Adobe Photoshop. Uh, sometimes we're using InDesign for the booklets or books or covers for something. Uh, it's so we using these three programs to creating something beautiful <laughs> and we learn how to use them so I'm taking the program that program the second year so digital design too and I learned a lot about how to use the Illustrator, Photoshop and InDesign and it's very helpful skills just in the regular life not only in the class uh, because for example create the poster for the uh, for my own club what we didn't really uh, talking about in the program <laughs> in the program yeah uh, so yeah uh, also this snowflake on the right it was I creating this by myself uh, to using the illustrator and use it in the film club in the film class to creating the animation so I combine two different classes to creating something in one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And Mr. Leckford, uh, photography, did you want me to, okay. Well, we'd like to have Dean, Henry, Jacob, and Alba uh, from our photography class. Yeah. Um, our photography class is more, more than just learning how to press the button on the camera. It is an art form ent entirely. Um, it's about learning how to place your subject, uh, learning the right lighting and the composition. Um, and black and when we do black and white film, just watching our photos come to life through the chemicals is so inspiring and it just challenges you to take even more incredible photos. Um, this, and we also learn to uh, critique each other's work respectfully and learn to um, work on our images. Um, I was really inspired by Humans of Samoa High, uh, Humans of New York, and Mr. Ledford and I started taking pictures of students around uh, Samoa High and posted them on Instagram. And um, it's been a really in exciting experience. So I encourage you guys to follow that people of Samoa High on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, I would like to start off by thanking you all for speaking with us. My name is Dean. Um, I started out in the photography program. In ninth grade, I started at SMC and transferred over in 10th grade, and the program really has changed my life. Um, Mr. Ledford and his teachings have taught me that I can be an artist, even though I haven't ever really thought of myself as one. Um, and throughout the class, I've taken photos of my friends and documented the way that we are going along in high school. Um, and I've gotten to places like the New York Times and the Getty Museum, and that's all because of the program. So thank you guys for having me. Hi, um, my name's Henry. I'd quickly like to say that Mr. Ledford, without a doubt, is the best teacher I've ever had, ever. Um, I'd also like to say that th this isn't this is like complete truth. Without the photography, without photo at Samo, I honestly would not be at Samo. I'd be homeschooled or something. It's literally why I wake up and go to school. If it wasn't for that, I would not be there. And also, um, I take my art photography very seriously, and it's so nice to have a place every single day that I can go and critique it and make it better and ask questions from Mr. Ledford and stuff to hone in and make my art better. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jacob. Um, I have probably had uh, over a dozen semesters in visual arts uh, at Santa Monica High School. I'm um, three consecutive years in AP Art, uh, two years in Mr. Ledford's class, um, and then the year in uh, ceramics as well. So I've kind of gotten this holistic um, view of arts at Samo High and I really have gotten to know um, the, the art department very, very well, um, and I'll be eternally grateful for what it's given me. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm responsible for um, one of the large public works that's up now on Olympic at Santa Monica High School. I helped propose and ultimately fund that. Um, 
and then also the, the work on 4th Street that's going to be um, coming up later this year. Um, and then as well as the, the project that we did in the gallery. Um, so I think that's something that the, the department, the art department as a whole has taught me is, um, you know, you, you make art, but it, art is really about uh, how you present it and the people who are viewing it. So uh, we actually live in like kind of a hub of public art, um, which is what I'm really passionate about. Um, so I think moving forward in our, in our kind of arts education, I think that this focus on like how we present ourselves, um, what we do with the gallery space, uh, that was I think a big step forward for us as a, as a department this year was uh, using this space that we have, this gallery space. It's a beautiful space, but for years it's really just been um, uh, kind of discarded and not really thought of in the way that, uh, in, the, in the imaginative way that, that we kind of, we would like to think of it as. I think that um, we're kind of moving forward in the way that we think about um, the level of intensity that we approach the arts and visual arts in, in specific. Um, so uh, just, I, I'm so happy that I can come speak to you guys today um, and kind of get some attention um, on what we're, what we're really trying to uh, push forward here, so thank you. thank you. And then finally we have Mason and Alexandra from Business and Marketing. Hi, uh, my name's Alex Steigelfest. I am currently enrolled in the uh, Echo Entrepreneurship class at Sam High. I'm also the general manager and finance manager um, at the Vikes Cafe and um, uh, the student, the on-campus student. I'm Mason Hackman. Um, I took the, our school's marketing, intro to marketing class last year, and I've done DECA since freshman year. Um, and this year I'm, an, I'm on the 2018-19 officer team. Um, would you like to? Yeah, sure. Okay, so the, the Echo Entrepreneurship class has changed my life. It's, it's my favorite class, definitely for sure, um, out of all the classes I've taken at Sam L. High. I've learned so much business knowledge that I've applied in DECA in my classes at Sam High, and uh, I will continue to use the knowledge that I have learned in my future in, in, in interviews, in, uh, 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 um, sorry, in interviews in, uh, and in my schooling in the future. Yeah, so the Vikes Cafe works as a learning laboratory for students that take marketing classes, um, and they can implement the skills that they learn. Um, we uh, wrote um, uh, something called a school-based enterprise report um, through DECA. I think the recording secretary has um, two copies of it. I don't know if you guys have that access to that right now. But um, it was a 60-page report, and from what I've heard from the DECA state officers, we were the only school in California to get the gold certification. So um, we're going to be competing in Orlando um, in an international competition, try to win for our school. Um, and we're going to go on about we our school has had a lot of success with um, student-run businesses in the past. Blockchain Girls is um, fighting for trademark rights right now, but they um, had national success last year. And Tier Three is a student-run business organization. Yeah. So um, so far in Deca, we've earned a lot of honors. I think there's about 16 students currently in, enrolled in every single time we've competed. Um, we've earned honors. Uh, we've earned honors at the local level, district, state, and now uh, national. national. So we've had, um, every time we've had first, second, and third place finishes within everyone's categories. Um, and at many competitions, we have every single member um, compete and um, achieve top eight finalists. So our chapter's um, one of the more successful in the state. It's participated in the community service project. We received recognition from Councilman Kevin McCohen. Um, on our work, we helped the homeless community. But for the first time this year, the Vikes Cafe has been able to serve free and reduced, uh, free and reduced lunch students because of some of the um, business strategies implemented by the students um, and using DECA volunteering um, to have more manpower to do so. And um, our teacher, Ms. Kemp, she's been absolutely um, absolutely amazing with providing us with opportunities to be successful. Um, we had 
uh, I think about four mentors that came in that were financial and marketing specialists where we were, we were able to work with and um, we, were, we, were, we were able to work on um, role plays and interviews for um, DECA uh, role plays and um, for, it'll help us with uh, jobs in the future. And we've had opportunities to earn industry certification, which have helped students um, in understanding business management in hospitality tourism. And it helps from a marketing perspective. But they had a safe serve certification on campus. And um, we had a 100% pass rate. Every member got above a 90% on that test. So that was really exciting for the group. And um, something I want to mention is all of um, the people that have helped us so far have been um, Samo High CTE alumni, and they recognize how much the programs have helped them become experts in their field. And I really appreciate that. I know because of Samo High's DECA program, I want to pursue a um, degree in economics. Yeah, and uh, I'll be majoring in entrepreneurship at Syracuse University. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions to ask anybody? On the CTE sure, we'll have it for a moment. All right. Um, again, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Wishart from the film department, uh, wanted me to share this with you, uh, some good news. Students have been selected for two film festivals coming up, uh, one being the Screen Film Festival, uh, which will be tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Tickets still available online, he says. Um, at the Arrow Theater, and then also um, in the West Flix um, Film Festival, second film festival sponsored by Westlake Village, uh, excuse me, uh, Harvard Westlake School, and that screening is gonna take place March Friday, March 16th at the Arclight in Hollywood, 5.30. So there's plenty of great news going on. And in, again, in celebration of Career Technical Education Month, I want to commend the amazing students uh, who are here tonight and thank you for sharing your time, the very talented instructors and the, uh, the leadership of Dr. Shelton at the high school as well as Lauren Polly Sheehan. I intentionally wanted to make my uh, comments at the, at the beginning brief so they have all the time that they needed there. But I do want to say that we have uh, a more robust uh, presentation about CTE and some of the plans um, uh, to uh, increase um, our, our, our CTE efforts at the high school through the district and that's going to be coming up in the next couple of months uh, so thank you very much and if there are any questions again from the board or anyone for, for, um, for our students or myself be happy to entertain them. All right. Thank you so much and thank you to all the students too very much appreciate their coming out this evening and sharing with us. Uh, friends, as we make our way to the superintendent's report, we have one additional commendation that Member Keene and I would like to bring so to your attention. In keeping with the agenda item of uh, recognitions and commendation, it, we have one more person to recognize tonight. So hopefully people in our audience and in the room tonight know about Youth in Government, which is an organization that uh, for us is run through Santa Monica YMCA. Uh, we have a great group of people there. Um, that group goes every year to Sacramento as part of a bigger statewide coalition. They try to pass legislation, they elect leadership, and I am very proud to announce that uh, the newly elected youth governor of the state of California is none other than our own uh, Santa Monica rep to the board, uh, Governor Aiden Blaine. So Aiden, I want to give you a shout out for that. Um, you can clap for that if you want. I'll, I'll let hands come together. It just shows you how how much can be accomplished by sitting among us for just six months. <laughs> We've really been a wonderful influence on you and, and, and you're welcome. You're welcome, Mr. Blaine. Keep up the great work. Congrats, celebrate all success. Congratulations. Congratulations. And I think, is, is it true, maybe someone from the dais knows that there's only been one other um, Santa Monica High School student to serve in this capacity. Is that uh, Ben Allen? Okay. So, congratulations, Aiden. congratulations. Dr. Dreddy, that brings us to your report. I'll, I'll keep this one short. Um, uh, the only thing I want to report on it, and I want to circle back to uh, some comments made at a previous um, uh, board meeting in Malibu uh, in terms of the mud that was collected during the last rains at, at the Malibu High School, uh, which impeded our ability to get into softball fields, baseball fields, and, and it was just a mess over there. But at any rate, I want to report out that we make, we're making great progress. Uh, after that meeting, um, the, direct, the director of Malibu Pathway, Isaac Burgess, got together with the site administration, the parents, our operations office. And they invited the engineer and really uh, had, uh, did a walkthrough of the, the whole uh, facility where the hill side is, where the mud came down. 
and I believe they're developing a game plan. And so right now, all week they've been clearing out the fields. So, uh, so, uh, so, so we're making good progress with that. But I wanted to kind of point that out to you because that was such a, I think that was a shocker for everybody. And, uh, and we are making good prog progress with that. Thank you, Dr. Drotty. Uh, colleagues, that now brings us to the consent agenda. Are there any items that uh, we would like to pull from that agenda? That's been moved by Member Foster, seconded by Member Lieberman. Are we ready to vote? Ms. Afshar? Yes. Mr. Mesher? Yes. Ms. Lieberman? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Mr. De La Torre? Abstain. Mr. Keene? Yes. And I'm a yes. So that's uh, five in favor, one abstention, no opposition to the consent calendar for this evening. Colleagues, we have no study session this evening. This brings us to our discussion items for the night. Our first discussion item is the Santa Monica Ed Foundation quarterly report to the Board of Education. And I see our friends in the audience. Welcome, Linda. Uh, Mr. President, I'll be excusing myself for this item. Thank you, Mr. Richard. We'll promptly come in and, and get you as soon as the report has been given, has been given. Good evening. I'm happy to be here to give um, you the Ed Foundation's quarterly fundraising update. Is this on? It is? OK. Um, but first, I want to tell you about Lucy. Lucy is a second grader in our schools. She's bright and bubbly and curious. And last summer, on the same day as her school's year-end picnic, Lucy was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes. So this means that every day before PE, she has her glucose levels checked to find out if she'll need a glucose tab before running around on the yard. And every day before lunch, Lucy talks with the nurse about what she's going to eat, and together they count her carbs. All of you on the di dais, with the exception of our student board member, um, are parents. Think about your own children. When they were young, you likely checked every night to see if they ate their lunch, hoping that they did before getting distracted by the monkey bars or kickball or whatever else was going on that might have been more exciting than eating lunch. So imagine the added stress of, of, just, of not just wondering if they ate, but also wondering if your child counted their carbs <coughs> and ate just the right amount of everything to keep their glucose levels good through the afternoon. And now imagine doing that without a trained health worker on campus to help. For many kids in California, that is exactly what's happening. State funding does not provide for full-time health office staff at most schools, leaving busy administrators and teachers who really aren't trained to fill, to fill this void. But because of donations to the Ed Foundation, our largest elementary schools have full-time health office staff on campus. Donations to the Ed Foundation mean that kids like Lucy have a trusted health professional down the hall to check her glucose levels and food every single day. And if something goes, does go wrong, there's a health worker on campus to help right away. We know about Lucy because her father reached out to the Ed Foundation to thank us and share his appreciation for the nursing team who helped his daughter as they made all the arrangements needed after her diagnosis. As he said, to know someone is there to give her fast acting, acting sugars if her levels are too low is crucial. It's everything for us. But really, the thanks go to our donors, the people that made this possible for Lucy. Tonight. I will give you an update about the wonderful giving from those donors so far. So January 31st marked the end of our parent campaign, which started on July 1st. During that time, we had a really strong start to the year with TKNK events um, at, at the start of school and back to school nights. We worked closely with our PTAs to raise awareness and participation at each school in Santa Monica. We had our fourth annual Pledge Days campaign we hosted phonathons and participated in Giving Tuesday. We sent out six different mailings between J July and January, including back to school renewal letters, calendar year end uh, letters, and postcards in January. Ed Foundation staff have attended and presented at principal meetings, teacher staff meetings, PTA meetings, and other parent meetings like school smarts and room parent meetings. During the last seven months, we had three $50,000 matches and uh, thanks to Bird, Santa Monica Place, and One West Bank who partnered together, and a generous anonymous donor. We had one $25,000 match from the Fairmont Miramar Hotel and Bungalows and MSD Partners during January. 
We had six $2,500 matches uh, from local corporate heroes, along with four $5,000 matches from David Yoon of Compass. As of January 31st, 3,267 donors have contributed, 27 of whom were parents. We raised 12.6% more from parents this year compared to this time last year, and we had an 11.4% increase in parent participation overall. You know from my being here before that we have two um, giving circles, the superintendent circle level, which is gifts of 5,000 and above, and our leadership circle level, which is $2,500 and above, and those giving circles um, have seen a 13.5% a increase uh, from last year. We're really thrilled to have so the support of so many of our local businesses. To date, we've raised 42.7% more from our corporate heroes this year. Um, and this slide shows you who our top corporate heroes are. And then we, uh, this slide shows you our um, additional corporate heroes. Uh, those names up there really are local businesses who continue to give year after year in support of our, our kids. And because our sponsorship for our wine auction happens, uh, that wine auction is in May, this list will grow because we are really, uh, it's the second half of the year when we are done with our parent campaign that we really focus on corporate heroes. So we're in a good position with them. So we're pleased that as of January 31st, we've raised $1,923,165 towards our $2 million uh, grant that we give to the district uh, for the 1920 programs. Uh, the full estimated cost of the programs in Santa Monica will be $2.3 million, but knowing that we have a solid fundraising and communications plan, we intend to fundraise through uh, June 30th, and we'll, we plan to get there. Between uh, now and June 30th, I've mentioned before that we, even though the campaign has ended for parents, we are going to work, um, continue to work with our TK and K families, as well as renewal donors, which are those that gave last year but haven't yet renewed. Um, we're going to work on the corporate heroes additionally and outreach to local foundations. And lastly, our wine auction. It's our signature event. It's at, uh, on Sunday, May 19th at the Fairmont Miramar Hotel and Bungalows. This is our fourth uh, wine auction, and we've been working on it for months. We've got restaurants already booked. We've got uh, almost all of our wine tables uh, also booked, and we are securing our live and silent auction items. We are really grateful that the Fairmont continues to host this event, which helps us keep our costs really low. Uh, Ellis O'Connor, Dustin Peterson, and Matthew Lehman are the leadership team at the Fairmont, and they truly understand that equitable public education benefits not just our students, but everyone in our community. Thank you. Any questions? There are no questions, but lots Great. of gratitude. Laura? Much, much gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, it now brings us to our next discussion item, which is item 8B, school security measures, ID checks, and cameras. I see Mr. Upton is coming to the dais. And we need to have Mr. Metcher. Carrie, will you? Thank you. If you just, I think he's right out there in the lobby. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Welcome back, Mr. Metcher. I'll get us started and then I'll pass it on uh, to a couple of my colleagues. Uh, so, uh, in the last uh, few years, we've discussed uh, security and safety issues. Uh, and many ways to move those forward, and it's been a very much of a discussion in the uh, safety committee. Uh, so we're coming to you tonight with two of the sort of first steps and sort of our thinking around some facility measures uh, that can improve safety and security uh, in our district. So I'm gonna 
without much ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring Gary Bradbury, our risk manager, up. He's going to lead the first part of this, and then I'll jump in at the end uh, for some more discussion. Thank you, Carrie. Good evening, President and board members. So I'm gonna be uh, speaking on these two measures that we have been considering in the safety committee for a number of months. Uh, one is the access uh, control system, which is basically a, a sign-in system, a badging system that we've been piloting uh, at a couple schools and, and also the placement of security cameras. So I, I just wanted to touch on uh, for you that maybe you're not as familiar with the uh, District Safety Committee, just wanted to kind of talk about that, what we're doing, uh, that what we are, or a management advisory committee that meets once a month to review policy, practice, member concerns, and data relevant to the health, safety, and security of district students and staff. The committee has worked last year to develop a strategy for improving school security that was recommended to the superintendent. The committee has also now been working on various aspects of that security plan for improvement. Uh, the district safety committee, the members, we have 18 uh, current active members of the district safety committee. Um, as you can see from the slide, uh, there are uh, a wide spectrum of representation there in our committee. Uh, all of these uh, have volunteered for this service because of their passion for safety. Um, I have not wrangled anybody into the safety committee. They have all gladly, uh, very busy people that have taken once a month time to get together and really uh, review the safety with, throughout the district. So the first thing to talk about here is access control ID check-in systems. The, uh, the following benefits we're trying to get from these systems is uh, the using a driver's license or other photo ID to create a visitor badge with a photo on it. Uh, it also uh, provides instantaneous screening uh, up for sex offenders using available uh, database of registered sex offenders. It also uh, helps the school to uh, check in people according to their own custom database if there are particular individuals who should not be on campus or need to be uh, process in a certain way because of custody issues or something, uh, they can create their own uh, protocols for that. Uh, it creates a searchable and exportable digital record for all visitors on campus, which uh, is valuable. Um, and before I go on to the pilot, um, just a comment on what we currently have is basically a sign-in sheet um, People are asked to sign their name, and then they give them a, a sticker badge to put on them and go through. But there commonly is no verification of who that person is, what you write down. I mean, you could write down Mickey Mouse on the, the sign-in sheet, and nobody necessarily would verify it at that time. So um, we're looking at this as a significant improvement to what we currently have. Uh, two pilot programs, one at Santa Monica High School with a system called Lobby Guard, and at, at Lincoln Middle School, uh, Raptor Technology Systems, both of them very similar. Raptor uh, Technologies is the leader in the nation as we understand it in this technology. <laughs> Considerations that the committee was looking at uh, for these systems is what are the procedures for parents who lack standard ID? Um, that, that is a concern because the, the system does uh, primarily work on the basis of a driver's license, but the systems do allow for you to use other IDs, other identification. 
what will this deter uh, entry for parents who have no ID? For example, we're concerned about uh, people who are in this country illegally. Uh, uh, would that deter their involvement in school uh, for the parents? Uh, basically, there's no ID required. You can manually, manually create a badge without any ID, so it's not necessary. We ask what burden will this place on school office staff because it's going to require more engagement of the staff, and um, I'll comment on that as we, we get to the results of our, our pilot. And how will parents and other visitors react to this system is also a concern. So the pilot uh, results for Lincoln Middle School are very positive. Uh, the system has proven easy to use and reliable. Uh, a visitor's badge can easily be created even if the person has no ID. The digital data log has proven very useful for administration at times. Check who is on campus or who has been on campus. Uh, the re it's, it's easy to process repeat visitors because they're already in the system easy to process them. The use of the system has been well received by staff and parents. It really hasn't, the principal has not reported uh, any negative comments uh, about it. The system does require staff, more staff time to process visitors, but we're looking at that as a positive outcome because there's more engagement and verification. The, the Pilot program at SAMRO did not produce such positive results, mainly because there were major implement, implementation problems related to the hardware and software that were reported to us. And um, the, the school staff there at SAMRO that was involved with this uh, system were also talking to the, the, their counterparts at Lincoln Middle School about their system, and there was seen to be consensus that uh, Raptor was a better system, <laughs> more easy to use, more reliable. Okay, so um, I could take questions on that if you like uh, at this point on that system. Do you have any? Okay, so I'll go on to the video cameras installed. Thank for you. Permanent protection. Okay. So the goal, the number one goal for these, these cameras as the committee sees it is to identify perpetrators of illegal and unauthorized activity at entrances to campuses, buildings, areas of high value property. So criminals entering into the, uh, the premises, breaking into the premises would be identified. Uh, so we would be placing looking at placing cameras at the main entrances of offices, main pedestrian gates, building entrances to major buildings, exits, entrances of stock rooms, computer labs, libraries, uh, rooms that are, have critical infrastructure equipment in them. Server rooms would have uh, cameras at the entrances. Second goal is to uh, identification of visitors where remote authorization of entry is required. Uh, this would be like a mirror smash where you have uh, your, the uh, office is towards the center of the campus away from the entrance gate. There they have cameras. Uh, so uh, we would be looking to actually improve that kind of screening uh, uh, of visitors through these cameras. Um, Goal three, identification of vehicles entering district parking facilities and loading and unloading zones that are used in the commission of a crime. We'd also want to capture, obviously, the, as much information about those vehicles as we could. The system requirements. Um, visual definition allowing for facial recognition, including during periods of low light. This is extremely important. If you cannot identify this person, then you get basically a fuzzy blob, which isn't of much, much use to us. Uh, visual definition to read license plate numbers and to distinguish vehicle make, model, and color. Again, so that we can engage law enforcement for recovery and, and action uh, 
based on the crime that's been committed. Uh, motion activated cameras that will record the target object as long as it, the, the, it's in the monitored area. Okay. Retention of recorded activity for a period that would include latent crimes. So in other words, storing this data for 60 days or more so that, you know, once a crime has been determined, maybe a latent crime, then we can use that recording. Remote real-time viewing of selected devices to permit visual verification of a captured event. So this would be able that staff at the district office could, could use uh, the internet to, to uh, in a secure way to visualize what's going on real time through the, on these cameras. Uh, the equipment is resistant to tampering, vandalism. Um, that's very important uh, based on our past history that they can not be easily uh, damaged. Systems can be expanded to other areas or upgraded to include additional features. So we're starting with uh, perimeter protection that is in keeping with current board policy, but obviously there, there may be a desire to, to, to expand that to other areas of the campus. Um, maintain maintenance for optimal performance. This is also based on history where if, if the equipment is not maintained, it becomes virtually worthless. So we would want to have a, a good uh, service agreement in place to make sure that this equipment is maintained for use. And smart analytical features uh, that could allow detection monitoring of entrances during non-business hours and notification of a central station and alarm company and the system administrators. Um, right now, our, our, we have motion detection throughout the district, but the software is getting so quote, smart, that now uh, basically we can start to rely on cameras to do the job that motion detectors used to do. So um, this is very promising for uh, crime detection. And then I just cite the references, different re references that we've used in developing these strategies. Okay. So is there any, any questions? Uh, me at this point. We're going to we'll finish I the full, the full presentation. Through. Ralph, I have you first on the list when it's. Okay. Stay close, though. <laughs> so, just uh, a few the numbers. Uh, so, the ID, the ID checks uh, system, uh, installing the Raptor program at all sites is estimated to be around $50,000. Uh, we would take this uh, uh, as we had discussed from Measure SMS and Measure M. Uh, and then for the camera systems, uh, right now we're estimating around a million dollars, and that, that includes the centralized cost. One thing that would be coming to you uh, is that we would be coming to discuss the, um, uh, that we would either be sole sourcing or standardizing the video management system, because we want one video management system for the entire district. Uh, as opposed to 16 different sets. And then uh, the peripherals, the cameras, those can, those can be bid out separately, but we really want to make sure that we're all looking at the same system. So that would be coming in here. And we could take questions or you could take public comment. They just we're going to take, we have one public comment, Kerry, and then we'll get right to questions. Very good, thank you. John? Speakers who have submitted a public speaking card prior to the beginning of this item will have three minutes to speak. Speakers who submit a public speaking card after the board begins public comment shall be allowed one minute to speak. I'm oh, sorry for your agenda item. Speakers and members of the audience are asked to refrain from expressions of support or disagreement that would intimidate other speakers or disrupt the meeting. We have one speaker on this item, it's Ann Thanawala, and you'll have three minutes. All right, so last week there was an article in um, the Washington Post Parkland schools turn to experimental surveillance software that can flag students as threats. Um, the article very much speaks to the, the anxiety that people have about the, la the, the um, influence of surveillance on our population. Um, it's, it's very technical, it's very uh, advanced. We're not hearing um, from this presentation 
what brand will be used. Um, in the article, they talk about a brand that uh, works directly with Motorola, which is what ICE uses. Um, they can actually uh, take so many pictures of a child on campus that they can uh, detect them by the clothing that they're wearing and then push a button and see everywhere that child has been on campus that day um, and then uh, penalize that child for not being where they're supposed to be. I've already heard uh, that this has happened, um, a situation where someone came to visit on campus to the to the office at one of our schools, um, stopped by a teacher to deliver a present first. The office immediately showed up where this, this person was to ask why they, were at, why they had stopped here. First, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, we should not be making our schools into prisons. Um, n there's no parent um, inclusion on the safety committee. That's a problem when uh, LCAP calls for more than that. Um, there's no privacy statement involved with the Raptor program. Where is the privacy statement? I've looked for it. It's not there. Um, so what's happening with that data? Uh, it, we heard that it was exportable digital records for whom? Where does it go? Um, going back to the brand, um, the, in, in the Post article, they spoke about Avalon. Um, I'm sorry, a Vigilon uh, as the compatible with Motorola, is that what we're looking at? Uh, how will the camera data affect the students? How, how is it stored? Um, we heard 60 days or more, how long? Um, is it going, going to be stored in the cr cloud? If it's stored in the cloud, it can never be deleted. What about vehicle ID? How is that going to be used? Will it eventually be used to track which kids are driving to school? How, when they're coming and going? We need some more information here. Facial recognition is a big issue. Should our kids and our families feel like they're under surveillance when they're on our campuses? I don't think so. We're very upset about this. Use of internet and real-time monitoring? What does that mean? system expansion and updates. How big is this going to go and how much money are we going to invest in this type of software when our, our kids are still not getting the math that they need? We've got failing grades. We've got um, all kinds of issues where the basic general stuff is not being met. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. That's the end of comments on this item. Thank you, John. Um, we'll go to Ralph and then Craig. Um, I have, have you know some of the, some some of these concerns. I, I thought, and and maybe um, some of the staff can talk about it. You know how this got to us. Um, the Dr. Shelton wants to. I, I, you know, what's our um, our goal? Because I think you know we're we're talking. You know, we're talking about something that has all these potentials to it, but what are we, where does this come from and where do we want to go? Um, I, I'm really, it's just, it's sort of being say, hey, we can do all this stuff. Um, I'm not necessarily somebody who's in, in favor of moving to society, which it looks like we potentially are, of, of, you know, that the government or organizations know where I am, everybody is at any moment in time, their complete movement in history and all this. And so. I think, you know, again, issues, so that's a first question. I mean, that's a basic question. Why are, why are we here? What's, really, what's our objective? And then we can, you know, if we can all agree on what that is, then we can talk about um, how we move forward. I, I think, you know, one, one if issue, there's two pieces here um, that were presented. One is a way to identify people who are, um, you know, want, want to come on campus. You know, we, we've, we've moved from a, um, in a much more unstructured system where, you know, our campuses were pretty open. You know, there was a, a time not too long ago when the, the community was looking at bike routes when they were talking about running a bike path right through the middle of Santa Monica High School, you know, 24 seven. Um, so, you know, uh, we've moved to having secure campuses. Um, and 
because at least for me, and I think for all of us, our objective is the safety of our students and their feeling comfortable um, and at ease. And so I, I have to agree that when we have committees that don't include parents and don't include students to discuss these issues and, and get their input, we're not really getting uh, um, what I would think would be full input on, um, on, on something that's of, of great magnitude that's been kind of sitting out there. I'm glad it's here to talk about. It's been sort of talked about for many years, but it's good that it's here. So anyway, you know, so there's, there's this issue of um, people coming on campus, and, and I, I get that, um, you know, and just to ensure that the groups we've talked about, um, you know, what happens to that data, you know, the safety about it, and what, what about people I don't get, you know, we want to ID everybody, but then if somebody shows up without an ID, we can let them on campus anyway, but how do we know who the person is? I'm not saying we shouldn't let them on, um, you know, if, if these are parents and, and the like. And then the second issue is sort of the security of the campus and what's the information that we want to know and how do we ensure it's all done in the right way and not really talking about all the expansions of things we can do on this in a way that might infringe upon um, you know, the, the uh, freedoms of, of expression of our students. So that's where I want to start. Thank you, Ralph. The list goes Craig, myself, John, Oscar, and we have a late um, chit that was submitted. And if there's no objection, we'll let that person have one minute now, and then we'll call it closed. So we had, we had one speaker that submitted but didn't get to me in time. My apologies. So we have one more speaker, which is Danica Jamison. But Danica, are you, that, that, I can only give you one minute because I got it after we started. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was turned in. I appreciate Welcome. it. Um, I'll take the one minute. I just want to speak to um, school security and Ralph to, the, to your point. Uh, I agree that. All, anytime we have a committee, we need to have students and parents involved. So um, that just needs to happen all the time. I'll speak to my experience with uh, Raptor and um, Lobby Guard. Um, the, in the past, we never had them. It's a vast improvement. Um, I've been to both sites, love Raptor, and I think that that um, is something that is doable, like it's fixable, all those things without the ID. So I think we just need to have those conversations, but that, to me, that's a definite thumbs up. My issue about um, cameras is that we have um, a campus that is full of very expensive things, and we have an increased amount of activity that needs to, we need to identify, and we don't have the manpower. So we have to make up our minds whether or not we're going to have safety or we're going to have cameras. And I don't like cameras as in London CCTV, but I do like cameras on the peripheral that can give us some sort of perimeter safety that we desperately need on our campus with the homeless population that we have intruding on our campus lately. Thank Thanks you. so much. Uh, thank you, Danica. That now brings us to the list is Craig, Richard, John, Oscar, Maria. Welcome. Welcome, Maria. Uh, hi. Oh, but did we want to respond to Ralph first? I think this is discussion, not questions, isn't it? I thought that was a question, sorry, from Ralph. I, I mean, I don't think we're doing clarifying. I think we're doing board discussion. I'm sorry, Ralph, it's your, it's your speaking. I was intending to speak, not to question. Well, I, th I read your questions oh. as being pointed. I mean, the, the presentation says where the goals and recommendations came from, and, and you made your point about who wasn't on that committee. That was one, right? And then. Okay, all right. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so, um, I'm going to come at this backwards because this is a discussion item. Uh, which discussion items are to help build something that comes back to us for action. So um, I believe, as people who've watched us before, that we cannot secure our campuses 100%, that we can never guarantee the safety of our children. I said that in the context of gun control particularly, that we need 
help from outside ourselves um, to keep our kids safe. I further have said before and will say again that there is, there is always a trade-off between security uh, that keeps other people out, if you will, and security that uh, turns our own lives into a prison, that the fences up to a point keep other people out and after a point keep us trapped. Um, and for us as a school board, we have to be incredibly mindful that even above the requirement that we give great college and career preparedness to our kids, even above social emotional, the number one priority that we all have is to keep the kids in our charge safe. Um, and then we have to balance that with all the other things. So to me, I have been an advocate as long as we've been talking about this, about enhanced perimeter security. It seems to me that keeping, ki keeping the kids inside safe and keeping the, pe kid, the people outside who need to be outside is a very big and important step in safety that does both those things. It keeps people out and allows the folks on our campus to to have a, as normal a life as we can in 2019 with all the threats. So I, uh, it wasn't in your presentation, but I support those unclimbable fences, the ones that were put in at Webster, I really like. I think they're aesthetic and effective at the same time. Um, I do think perimeter, I, I do think that perimeter cameras, i.e. monitoring the fences, so that somebody can't bring a ladder and climb the fence while nobody's looking because we think the fences are impermeable is a second step to make unclimbable fences really difficult to traverse. So I am in favor of perimeter cameras covering the entire perimeter. Um, I also am in favor of, and you didn't really refer to it here, but hardened entrances. We need choke points with locked doors and remote access to make sure that the staff who are guarding our kids are not themselves at risk to an intruder. Um, and as just a suggestion um, from the dais, it seems to me that, that the, we, uh, to the ability to swipe in before you ever get into that room might be an added checkpoint because if I'm looking at a camera in the office and I'm busy, unless somebody is, is quite apparently a problem, I may swipe somebody in who turns into a problem. So there, we could actually have swipes outside that you have to already have an ID to get through or there's a heightened level of procedure before we let you into our, uh, to our center. And likewise, the idea of a remote camera on a gate is kind of problematic for me. It seems to me you either swipe in through a remote gate or you come around to the main entrance and get cleared through in some other way. So I'm not really comfortable with remote cameras, bearing in mind I'm only one board member of seven, but that's my suggestion. Um, and I really, really do like um, uh, the idea of card access. Um, I think it's really smart and I like that it combines the ease of something m many people already have with the ease that we can provide this to people that for whatever reason, and I would really prefer if you'd find a different way to refer to people who are undocumented in this country, um, that people may not have those government IDs. Um, so that's what I believe, that's what I agree to, and that is the core of your presentation. I like that you ran tests on the two systems and you found one superior. Um, as somebody said, I forget who, um, I, I, I think, anyway, um, I think it was our second speaker. Um, I think there's a very big distinction between perimeter security and what happens on our campuses to protect uh, high value property. Um, I'm not prepared to have that conversation in this context, or maybe I'll say it more clearly. I do not want to have that conversation in this context. Um, I am very eager to talk about fences access points, perimeter cameras, hardened entrances by way of protecting our kids. What we do, and my vision of those cameras, pardon the pun, is that they are watching the fences. 
And if you're not climbing the fence, you're not a person of interest to those cameras or to anybody else. Um, so we, uh, uh, and if we got to the point of cameras inside to protect high value assets, the dramatically higher level of scrutiny for me would need to be applied to do that. The idea of motion detecting our kids, face detecting our kids, uh, fills me full of horror. So that's not okay with me. I would need a lot of persuasion to think that's a good idea. If from a security point of view, which again, I'm gonna make distinct from a campus perimeter thing, but from like people stealing things point of view, I don't have any problem with cameras inside facilities that should only be accessed by people who have authorization to be there in a machine room, sure, but not at the door going in, inside at the door when you open the door, something like that. But I, I think, um, I, I would, when we get, to, I, I would ask that we separate these things, Dr. Drotty, and when we do, I'm just gonna reflect that I, I would have a very high level of proof needed to think that that was a good idea. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, I have myself, then John, Oscar, and Maria. Um, I want to uh, first agree with um, the earlier comments with Ralph. Um, I too believe, Dr. Drotty, that um, we, well, let's first say this is a discussion item, right? So we're going to be giving direction to the board after we have our conversation. And I think that I would like to share uh, Ralph's concern that before anything comes back to us for a final determination, um, most certainly um, parents and uh, students need to be a part of the deliberation that comes to us. So I uh, wholeheartedly agree with um, that piece that, um, that Mr. Metcher pointed out. Uh, I also agree with each and everything that, um, that uh, Craig stated. I too um, am committed to the perimeter cameras, uh, but I am absolutely opposed to the surveillance of um, any human beings with inside of, um, of our communities. I, um, I'm really about the aesthetics of the fences, so I support you on that. Um, and you've heard my criticism from the dais on many occasion with regards to the cyclone fences as compared to some of the other really more aesthetically pleasing and non-prison-like um, designs, if you will. I mean, yeah, like, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and then I wanna say that um, I'm really grateful for this presentation because um, as I think Linda mentioned earlier in the evening, all of us save our student board members or parents and we've all put our children through these schools or are doing so. And I have an anecdote. I'm glad that Dr. Shelton's here tonight too. I think it's a great, and, and Dean Baxter. So to avoid that crazy pickup on Michigan and 7th, I now drive myself along Olympic and I stop at the loading zone right there before the alley. And that's where I sit and I tell my son, you text me when you're walking out that gate so that we can like coordinate this pickup. And I watch the kids jumping over that fence daily. Daily, 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 daily. And then um, I said, oh, I guess that's not a big deal. They're leaving the campus, right? But then for the first time, I'm sitting there and I watch the students, thankfully, jumping into school. And I went to go and pick up my son early for a, an appointment, a doctor's appointment, but I was waiting for him because he was coming out. So these kids were late from lunch is what I detected. And this is just my doing my own, my own investigative uh, you know, deduction here. They were late, didn't want to get in trouble, but they're jumping the fence. And I thought that was pretty easy. That's a problem. That is a problem that somebody could get into that campus that easily and be undetected. So I, I know that's just one story. It's anecdotal, I understand that. But I know that that's happening. It's also happening on Pico Boulevard and Sixth Street. Well, Pico right by the, by the um, what we that different fence there now. But we've all seen this. So I just wanna put my, 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 um, my voice with what Craig has said on perimeter fences. Um, I'm opposed to the surveilling within. I, I think that I'm 100%, I don't think, I am 100% supportive one board member with regards to the Raptor program because um, while it's only anecdotal too, I've talked to the parents at Lincoln um, who are just friends of mine. Uh, it seems anecdotally that there is 
uh, uh, approval of that and, and happiness with it, but I think we need to have some sort of formal presentation to the board that the parent and student community have been engaged there and that they too think that it has been a success. And, and I would also say that that signing into Olymp uh, to Santa Monica High School has been difficult and, pro and wrought with, that that one has been bad because <laughs> I've experienced that as a parent going to the campus. Um, but we need to do something here. And, and, and I think that all of us know that this is part one of a safety talk that's coming to us and, and proposals. And I am a big supporter of what's coming in point two, which are those blue lights and emergency buttons that are on campus. And so I sure hope that when that comes to us at some point in time, um, which I've been calling for um, both on and off of the dais, that the uh, PTA and students have been engaged also. At the high. So it's similar to what we have, Maria, at the college, the blue light emergency buttons, because I think it was actually, I think maybe Danica who spoke to the board some time ago and saying, I think it was Danica, or maybe it was at a PTA council meeting, that when somebody had waited onto the campus, um, there was no immediate need, like how do you emergency hit a button without having to get on a cell phone or sending somebody to be a runner to get to, to, to somebody who can get some help. So I want to make sure that when that comes back to us that this has been maybe tested by parent community too. Thank you very much. Those are my thoughts. John, then Oscar, and Maria. Okay, so I'm going to try to keep this to what we're talking about here and not what we might be talking about at future meetings. Um, one, I think everybody's been watching too much CSI and everything else. Because I don't think we're talking about a facial recognition software that can pick out a face and then figure out where they've been over the past three months. It, it said facial, rec facial recognition during periods of low light so that if somebody comes in and breaks into a building, we're not looking at a blob. We can actually recognize what this creature was that came onto our campus. Very different things. The words are the same. The order that they're put in makes a big difference. Mr. John, what? Mr. John just one thing. But I did lean over to you and say the same thing. And thank you for correcting that because I said facial recognition. I got nervous. Oh, no, so I, think, I think I can see how people have, yes. to, have that. But it's like the, 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 the thought that we're yes. putting something in that would do that. Thank it, you for the clarification. We are, we are monitoring. This is a plan to monitor schools, not monitor students. Um, there's nothing in here that talks about monitoring students. This is about um, creating a safe environment for our school, creating a safe environment for the property on our school and making sure that people who should not be on our campuses do not have access to our campuses. That should not be something that we're arguing about. That's something that we all should agree to. The other thing, we've brought security and safety things in front of this board that I have pushed back on. This is not one of them. Because at a certain point, we have staff that has been entrusted with our students. We have staff that has been entrusted with our property. And at a certain point, we have to allow staff to make decisions that, that can then accomplish those two things. I do not think this, what was presented to us today, other than the financial aspect of it, that we have to be okay with, but let's not forget what we put into SMS. We did put safety and security of our campuses in SMS. I don't think this rises to that bar that we need to do as if we were doing some other program that, that was more controversial or needed more input or more study sessions or more this and that. I don't think this rises to that level. I have trust in our staff to say that this is what we need now to secure a campus. We have had theft of computer equipment. We've had theft of tens of thousands of dollars of equipment from our schools. We need to prote protect the things that we have on our campuses. So. If, like what Craig said, if we have to put cameras inside those rooms that have those valuable things, then I am all for that. If, if, if Sam O'Hai says they need to protect something, I am for that. Malibu High says they have to protect something, I am for that. So I don't think this is such a dramatic step. Maybe down the road we have some dramatic things. This is boilerplate. This is simple. This is making sure that the people who are not supposed to be on our campuses do not have access to our campus. And if they do try to come on, we will find you. Thank you, Mr. King, and thank you for the clarification about the CIS. I don't watch, great if you had but, that. but I don't watch that program, so I don't even know how that would work. Okay, Oscar, and then Maria and Lori. You know, I appreciate I appreciate this uh, discussion because obviously, all of us are very concerned about how we keep our campuses safe and our students safe. And you know, and the sad reality, the number one threat to students, uh, especially at the high school level, is our students. 
You know, we really don't have a problem at the elementary and middle school level. But, um, and I would say that most of the threat to young people, especially at the high school level, because you know, high, middle school and high school is really where we have um, most of our, our, our issues. Um, a lot of it happens off campus. So you know, things that happen off campus uh, or in the, in the periphery of the school is really um, a lot of concern. And we're not talking about that you know, so much. But in any case, I think um, in terms of, in terms of this, this discussion, uh, I agree with everything, everyone who said that the cameras um, on the periphery would be important. Um, uh, with uh, motion detectors and all that, I mean, because one thing is to to get the footage, but you know, the other thing is how how useful is it and, and the quality of it. And uh, a lot of, a lot of times, you know, there's there's uh, the technology doesn't always work very well. So you know, uh, what I didn't see here is sort of like ongoing costs um, because I know that that that'll happen as well. You know, there's there's you know, I don't know if there's like some type of insurance program or whatever where they guarantee that this you know camera will work for or we can buy insurance on it where where the, it'll be replaced I mean that that's something that we don't know in terms of those costs um, I, I, I'd like to learn more about the two pilot programs you know the uh, lobby guard and the Raptor technologies to see what what you know what we can learn and, and how, how we can be better informed I know in the initial discussions we had about uh, a closed campus some of the parents were concerned that they couldn't go on a campus um, and I know I, I, I you know, I was accustomed to walking my my uh, my child all the way, you know, to to the main sort of lobby area, and then the other day I was uh, I was stopped at the gate and kind of felt a little odd, you know, kind of like wait a minute, you know. Um, but I understand why they're doing that. Um, so if there is a, a a way that we can, you know, have people walk on a campus because they've been cleared, you know, there's a like like a, a keychain or something that can go on that's easy. Some people forget their wallets, you know. So it'd be important to think about what what is it that um, if there's a if, if it's more than just like a card or an ID, you know, that to get people onto campus. The uh, other thing is about uh, the other question I have is in terms of training for staff. So who's going to be trained, you know, to monitor the also the security team, you know, what type of training can we provide for them? Um, the police department is right across the street from Santa Monica High School. I don't really know if there's any uh, sort of emergency preparedness or or, or or uh, let's say exercises that we can do, you know, with Santa Monica PD, or what type of training can we attain, or our staff can attain uh, from Santa Monica uh, police. But the training, I think, is going to be very important as well to think about, you know, those protocols. Once we install these new systems, how those systems interact with uh, our, our uh, you know, administrative teams uh, at the various schools. Um, but uh, you know, I think I think overall, I mean, it's a million dollars uh, just in. Uh, in, in cameras at all schools, and then and then I'd like to know more about, um, you know, what does that purchase in terms of like, you know, how many times do we have to repair a camera? What's the what's the life of those cameras? Just understanding more about that, so we really so we get a better idea of what the real cost is going to be over time, because this is just like year one, but then, you know, um, what happens, you know, year two, year three, and all that. And the last thing I want to uh, push for also is parenting, parent and student engagement. So making sure that um, we, th the district safety committee is one de dealing with this specifically, but we also have a, a district advisory committee that deals with uh, health and safety and so forth. So I don't know if, if we want to um, um, communicate or have a liaison. I don't know if there, there might be a liaison. I didn't see it, but I'm sure there probably is. Yeah. And, and, and just, uh, and just making sure that we have, um, you know, robust parent and student engagement to, to get their input as well. Thanks. Thank you, Oscar. That brings us to Maria and then Lori. Yes, you know, and I, Ralph. You know I've, I've had the experience of using, I guess, the one at, at um, what is the check-in point? Um, the one that they use at, at um, Lincoln, the control ID check-in at Pally High School. And it's, and it's great because I think they, they, they run your, your driver's license through and it's great. And once you get checked in once, they'll have you on record. So you don't have to go in and out. I mean, they know who you are. And, and, or, and or they can just t type in your name and you'll get a printout. But it's a good thing because there's a printout with your face on it. So it's like nobody can come in with just a name badge, but it's you actually have your face. So I think that for the cost of that, we should go for it because I think that will work. I know the one on Samuel High didn't make sense because it's, I, I use that Pally as a comparison to in art in, at Samuel High, which is too many issues. And they didn't really know what was going on, unfortunately. Either that or the staff weren't trained or whatever, but it wasn't working very smoothly there. 
So for that, that's not a big issue for me. I think we should move forward with it as soon as possible. The other thing, though, is the cameras. Um, for me, the expense is it's extremely high. And I know for the periphery, but what I'm reading here, and that's what I was looking for in this, but I just saw it right here. The system is not going to be re regularly monitored. So are we going to use them just in case, let's say, we get, we get we, some, they steal some stuff, and then we're going to check later, like a day or two later after it happens? So what's the purpose of having those if we don't have somebody that's at least going to be monitoring on a daily basis, which increases the cost? So just like, you know, uh, the, and Oscar de Torre was mentioning, what is the additional cost in, in, in really having a, a system that's really going to work if nobody's going to monitor it on a daily basis? It makes no sense to me. Um, I think that if, if anything, I agree, that we have to look at other safety measures. I think as we are building the new buildings, I think that's just part of what I think the new buildings have to be in terms of modern, like they did at Santa Monica College, they're on remotes. So, the, so somebody can unlock a certain room at, from, uh, remotely. So I think, you know, as we're modernizing our, our, our um, high school, I think we should be able to do that in all of our classrooms. You know, start building that safety mechanism as you build out your building. And it's something that I don't know if we even brought it out as a piece as we're building. I mean, I don't know, Carrie, do, are any of the new buildings have anything like that? Build, build, your building and security unlocking and I mean uh, the new buildings we're building? All the new buildings that we're currently building uh, will have electronic locks. Okay. And the next time I see you, uh, the, we're going to be discussing pushing electronic locks across the district that will provide the mm -hmm. uh, ability to control those access, know who's coming and going, and also uh, provide lockdown opportunities. Right. Um, and that's great for me. For me, I don't know what the expense of that would be, but I think in terms of when it goes in lockdown, Somebody can just automatically lock it up and, and you're done, you know, and it'll keep access from any, any intruder that's running around on your campus. Um, one of the other things, though, I think we have to be real careful. I think we have, I've seen the committee, the makeup of the committee, but I'm in agreement. I think it's, some, it's now, this should be really brought out to the DAC, the, the, you know, and bring in, you know, um, the parents that are involved with the district advisory, the safety committee, and get them involved. And have, give some more input. I think we need parent input on this one. It's not something that, in, I think the managers are there and did a great job. I think it's, it's, a, it's a good start. But I think the investment, especially of $8 million right now, I mean, I, I think we should, there has to be more discussion and looking to see what is going to be the best um, for the money that we're going to spend. And for me, it's, I don't know if this will do it, even if it's just the periphery, when there's no monitoring. It says it, it'll be, who knows, you know, so what's the purpose of it if nobody's going to look at it for weeks on end, uh, you know, unless there's a burglary or something? So for me, that's the only thing at issue that the ongoing cost of it would be, the maintenance of this thing would be to have somebody monitoring um, the cameras. Thank you, Maria. That brings us to Lori, then Ralph. Okay. So I think what's obvious is this is, to Ralph's original question about the why, I, the why is it's about safety and I think secondarily the perception of safety. Um, I largely agree with what John said, but I, I will admit that I, you know, I have, my reservations are about creating campuses that make students feel more fearful than they in real life need to be and about keeping our safety mechanisms um, with that in mind, developing what we, what we do with that in mind. And I, I also think, I actually think our staff have paid attention in many ways to the other articles I keep reading about, about all these incredibly intricate safety things that districts are putting in that are way, I think, out of proportion to what in fact, any realistic threat is, and they scare kids to death. So I feel like our staff has not been going in that direction at all, um, despite the little scariness of the facial recognition, which I knew you didn't mean <laughs> being geared at students. Um, I think that the check-in system sounds great, and it really addresses all the controversy we've had on all the elementary school campuses recently about how are we going to keep our schools safe and yet let parents enter, et cetera. I actually haven't had the experience that any Maria has. It sounds wonderful. Um, and I also agree, as Craig said, with definitely with enhanced perimeter security. I'm, I don't know what I feel about the rest of it, but I don't think it's 
necessarily inappropriate. Um, what I do think is that, yes, I think that once Richard brilliantly summarizes board, the board direction after this, if you can, <laughs> if you can uh, maybe hone the proposal a little bit in keeping with that, and then figure out maybe with Dr. Drotty where to take this to get some parent input and student input, I think that's, and then come back to us, I think that's where we should go. And I would dare say that even some staff input because on a larger scale, you've got a lot of staff represented, but I mean teachers, people who are there every day. By the same token, I do want to say with respect to parent input that what I would expect is that even though sometimes these things sound um, maybe ominous to us, we're, I think we bend over backwards to make sure we don't uh, want to be taking people's information and sharing it, getting, looking at their faces, doing things that are invasive, basically. I, I really believe that most, it, that you will find that most parents really want to feel that their kids are safe when they go to, camp, go to school, whatever, at whatever level. And as Craig said, I think very well. I, unless you feel your kids are safe, and you know, unless kids feel safe, um, the rest of it doesn't really matter, uh, um, even though the rest of it is really what we're here for. So um, I have no issue with the committee. I think the committee is fine. I don't think you necessarily have to have parents on the committee, but I think once this is sort of as baked as you can get it, I think it would be great to go out. I think it's important to go out and see what the reception is out there before we go and spend the money on it. Um, so I would leave that to you and working with Dr. Drotty, I guess, to figure out where to go and how to do that. But um, I guess that's all I, all I want to say. Oh, the one comment I want to make about monitoring and maybe the staff, somebody could respond to this. I don't know that it's, that it matters that you're not monitoring it on a regular basis. I feel, <laughs> I have to say, the image I, that is conjured up for me is when you watch one of these crime shows, when the detective goes around because the crime was committed on a certain date, collecting the hotel whatever footage uh, from that date so that they can see who came and who, it's not, it's not really about monitoring it every day and every minute because nothing goes on most of the time that needs to be monitored. Um, so that's my only comment about that one and maybe you could speak to what you were thinking about that. So um, current, current board policy, which there is on, uh, it uses outdated terms, uh, closed circuit television, but there's no intention of monitoring. Um, it's, it's really imp impractical to, and over time it's shown not very effective to have somebody sitting in front of a bunch of monitors. Um, so no, it, the, the intention is not for real-time monitoring, but as you pointed out, after, after a fact, we go back, we look, and uh, use that for evidence in solving the crime. So that's what it's for. Thank you, Lori. That brings us to um, Ralph, John, and Aiden. Um, so th thank you all for answering a lot of my questions. <laughs> um, and so I, th I mean, so I, th I think if we go back to, you know, that the, the two issues, one is, is the ID, which I think clearly, I think we'll all feel, pick the system that works the most, let's implement it, but let's, you know, make sure that it's that it's fair, um, you know, f for all, and and there should be some you know concern about where that data is being stored, and you know if it has any vulnerability to to uh, you know other people's um, accessing that data, you know somehow, if it's, and uh, you know, um, I think we you know we sh we need to be con concerned about that, um, and and I'll say this you know. John, in terms of the bond money, yes, you know, the, the community has given us money to do certain things about safety, but they also want us to do it in a way um, that the community feels is appropriate. So I don't know, you know, until we have some discussions, I'm not sure that they, and I don't know. So 
you know, there are things that we don't, that aren't here in this presentation. Our board policy isn't here for us to just review and look at and to understand. Um, I, I, you know, when we look at spending a million dollars, I have no idea what that means. I don't, I don't have one, any uh, uh, sort of a map of any school. I don't know, for instance, around Rogers or McKinley or just pick a school or Malibu High School, how many cam what does that mean in terms of cameras? I mean, are we, so that we can have a discussion about the value of, you know, of, of the program and its replacement costs over time, um, its maintenance, or is this really just for entries? We have, you know, worked very diligently and successfully to secure our campuses and make them secure in a way. So if, if this is an issue about protecting our property, you know, when other people, when we're not there, um, that is that issue about, okay, where we keep equipment, maybe that's where this should be focused, um, more than, you know, figuring out, you know, who jumped the fence at some point and then costing us a million bucks to do that, if, if that's not, not, not the issue. Because our campuses, I mean, are these cameras on 24-7? Because come 2.30 in the afternoon or 3 o'clock, our campuses are open, particularly our, our secondary campuses, they're all open for, for hours and hours. So uh, I just, you know, for me, I don't know that we've gone well enough, you know, far enough to really look at the, really drill down and look at all the details of this. Uh, maybe I'm just not, people have, I'm not getting it and understanding it well enough to just say commit, fine, let's just, just spend a million here and, and, and understand the ongoing parts of it. And um, in terms of who's looking at it, sure, I understand that and, and I totally respect you, you know, the people who are on the campuses every day saying there's a problem and let's figure out how to solve that problem. But at the end of the day, particularly at, at the secondary schools or at the high schools, you know, we have young adults there. Um, we would, I would think we would want to hear what, how they reflect on what we're thinking. Um, it's modeling, you know, the behavior we want, behavior we want them to have in the future. And, and they, you know, and they often um, give us insights into into other ways of we might be doing things that, that, that will help support what our goals are. So I think that you know, it's really crucial, particularly you know, at the secondary levels, um, that we do that. And, and that you know, when we make a decision or are starting to move forward, that we do inform the, you know, the community. We have um, communications you know, to all the parents in the community about what we're thinking of doing mm -hmm. or what we're planning on doing and, and get that feedback. Um, you know, we just took a vote to say, okay, great, we're, all these, th the things that maybe I brought up out of my um, ignorance about it, you know, questions about, about data, about um, recording, about tracking, you know, we, we have to be really clear about what it is that we're doing so that it's, it's understood by every, everybody in the community, I mean, particularly, you know, parents, certainly, you know, students and that at different levels changes and parents and other, other members of the community so that they see what we're doing. There are national conversations going on about, you know, Parkland's having that conversation about what their state is saying, what they think they should do, and they're giving the money to do things that they don't necessarily want to do. So there's no problem, I don't think there should be a problem with us having you know, conversations about um, what's mo the best way for us to ensure that our, our students are safe. Issues about our property, you know, it's sort of a different discussion how we want to ensure and protect our property, you know, when nobody's there and, and our equipment and the like. Um, you know, sorry to go on, but you know, like the, um, the locking, the, if we're moving to um, how doors are open and closed, you know, our policy a number of years ago was that when there's a teacher and a student in the classroom, the door is open always. So is our policy now that, you know, what's our policy about, about doors and access um, because that was protecting students um, from, you know, potentially physical, um, you know, abuse that, that had occurred. So some decisions impact others. And I know it's changing, you know. I go to city halls for, um, you know, professionally, and, and I've gone to our planning department here in town for 35 years and always have walked into the office and said, I'm here for an appointment. And just last week I, I walked in and, I, you know, well, <laughs> they were coming towards me to get me out of there because they had instituted a new policy, you know, for a an access card to a, a previous door, which happened to be unlocked. So I just walked in, like I always had. So 
there are, you know, I understand the changes. Let's just make sure that we um, really understand, you know, make sure that what we're going to do um, is done, you know, for the right reasons, that, you know, we accomplish our goals and, and that it's transparent. Everybody understands what we're doing and we understand the costs because we certainly know up here um, the issues of what things cost. Thank you, Ralph. I have um, John and then Aiden, and then if there's no objection, I'll try to um, figure, I'll try to. S Good luck with that. You, I would like to do the shot as the chair. No, or, you, want, you want another speaking. I want another speaking. Okay, so let's see if we can close the list. We'll go John, Aiden, Craig, and then we'll, and Maria. John, Aiden, Craig, Maria, and then I'll make a go at it. Is that okay? Mr. Great. John. Um, well, just, uh, just on a point of reference because multiple people are referencing Marjorie Stoneman Douglas I have the good fortune of being there on March 13th um, to screen and I will certainly talk to the people there about the security conversations they're having as opposed to us talking about something from 3,000 miles away so I, I will report back on that two questions for staff one do we have the ability I thought I read this somewhere do we have the ability to monitor in real time from one from a central location somewhere Let's say there's an event happening on a campus. Do we have that ability in real time to access cameras and use that information? If we know the answer now, I'd love to hear it. If not, I can wait. Yes, we do. Okay, that's a great answer. Thank you very much, Carrie. You should be on the board with that brevity. Um, second question, which is not so easy, and when you come back to us with an action item, maybe we should have this. Uh, if, if you can give us some projected costs. So we're not going to be dealing with a white elephant system. You know, if you can let us know what maintenance costs might be, when do you think we might need to swap out equipment? If you could project some costs out, that would be super useful. Um, third, before I was here, I was on site council at SAMO for a couple of years. So I think I've heard this conversation for two or three years now. Um, it has gone through parents. It has gone through students. It has gone through teachers. It has gone through administrators. If we want to deliberate this further, I'm cool with that. I think SAMO has done its public process. I think SAMO has done its work on this. I do not want to slow down this happening at SAMO. So if we want to, if we want to hit the break for the rest of the district, that's a conversation that I will maybe go along with. But right now, I feel SAMO has done its work. And that's the school that's asking for this. I'd like to give them the support that they feel they need. So, so that would be, if we're going to go forward, so direction I would give down the road is that's where my head's at. Okay, that's all I got. Uh, Ralph has a clarifying question for something and, you said. And it's not just this point for you, John, but as I asked is that I don't know what that system is at SAMO. So maybe that president, we haven't, I, I know they've talked about it and we're all superb of it. I don't know what that means in terms of number of cameras, where they are, what the system is that we would be asked to be putting in at this time. It's not here in front of us. Okay, that's well, all. We, we have the... Okay. Th this stuff exists in a report that I know I've seen. I know I've talked to Gary about this. I know I have physically seen this report. So maybe we should get that back out and recirculate it because this information exists. Well, we think, uh, point well taken. So, Mr. Aiden, Mr. Governor. <laughs> Thank you. Well, from a student's perspective, I, I've gone to Samo High pretty much every day for the past three years. And I think it's absolutely necessary to have this type of security system. I think that right now, the way it is on campus, um, I, I love our, our school, but I, I don't think we have enough security. I think that our security guards, half the time they don't check IDs. Half the time, when we, when we walk into campus, you just write your name down. You could basically write someone else's name, and no one would know. And same with parents, like someone mentioned that point. And I think that there needs to be something more, because I've thought about this at many times before. What happens if someone walks onto the campus with a, a, just a gun? Like, no one would do anything about it because no one can do anything about it. Obviously, the police station is right near us, but we don't have that security level. And I think a lot of the students feel the same way, that it's just, it's not safe. And as much as we want to say it's a safe environment, it really isn't because there's nothing there to protect us. And I think that having this sort of security system, whether it's Raptor or Lobby Guard, and then having this um, kind of perimeter security, with the cameras, I think that that needs to be implemented. And I think that obviously we don't want to cross the personal line and get into like this whole face recognition, which is not what's actually happening. But I think that there does need to be, like really does need to be an aspect of security on campus because right now we're just not there considering technology in the 21st century. And 
Sam, I was just not up to date with that, and I think something like this would be really beneficial to us. Thank you, Aiden. Of course. We did just hear our elected student representative on the board, and Craig, and then Maria, and then I'll make a, an attempt to um, bring everything together. As I'm sitting listening, I'm trying to figure out what I would be doing if I were staff. So, I mean, we, we have, as we often do, pulled at so many pieces of this and added so many new pieces in that I think we risk the integrity of the idea that was coming here. Um, I would like to see the next step be about perimeter security. We can have other conversations at other times. Um, I believe, for me, the idea of linking cameras to fences is a fence is only as good, only works until somebody climbs it, and by putting cameras on it, you create the deterrent to that. My expectation is that those cameras are motion detection and would alert someone to the extent that the perimeter was violated and then you can take action. Um, and so to me, that's a secure perimeter for the school when you combine it with a single, or in the case maybe of SAMO, maybe more than one hardened access point, but most of our campuses would be one hardened access point. The uh, card readers seem very simple, very fair, very equitable. Um, it helps in emergencies because we know who's on campus and I guarantee you if we ever know exactly everybody who's on campus, it's, it's a happy happenstance because that just is not the way our campuses work right now. So all of that, fences, camera, motion detectors along the perimeter, hardened access points and card readers seem to me to be a solution that the public voted for in the last bond. Certainly I've been talking about these precise things in supporting the bond and the public was super responsive to those ideas. There may be people who want more. We may have security uh, con con uh, concerns on our campuses. These are all other conversations. But rather than muddy this up and m not get to it quickly, I would like to stick to those conversations and get that done moving forward with our new bond money and getting our campuses secure because, you know, in the 80-20 rule of life, I feel like this will go a long way toward raising the safety of the kids on that campus in a way that nothing else can. And we don't know if and when we will have wished that we had done this quickly. So I'd like to move forward on this as quickly as we can with those simple parameters. Thank you, Craig. Our last speaker, Maria. No, 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 no. just to clarify, thank you, John, for your point of clarification, because it's well noted in terms of your participation already with, you know, stu with uh, parents, you know, when you were involved at, at Samo High, which is well noted. But we're not, I don't think we're muddying. I think all of us are here, um, Craig, in terms of what, we're just, off, you know, we're just giving our opinion, whether, you know, it's just, I think, noted, but I think it, the movement towards, I think, what, what's being brought to us moves forward. Um, I think it's great. I mean, the fact that the Raptor, if the Raptor Technologies has a face printed on there, because there, I don't know if that's a system that actually takes a picture of, of your driver's license, then go for it. Because I think that's the best kind, because I know with Samuel they didn't have it. So I think that's the best. At Pali, right away, they just kind of look at you, and that's you. It's your, it's your driver's license. And if anything comes up, I guess they can. My only concern with, is this, is, is uh, and, and I agree with the periphery of the cameras, is that Unfortunately, all our, our, the concept of our schools being community centers means that most of the time they're open in the evening. And at the, at the elementary schools, I mean, you can literally close every the periphery except for the front. And, um, or, and the front is only open. Everything else is closed off. But in the middle schools, in the high schools, where you actually have access to the play fields, because those are our parks and community people use them. That's my only concern. I know that at John Adams, you can lock it out. You can actually close it off, because there's, I, I think you can, from the actual play field. You can close off the school portion of it. But, and then I'm not sure whether um, Lincoln, ha Lincoln has that too, kind of. Um, 
and but Samuel, you, you really can't. I mean, there's, I mean, you're looking all around from Fourth Street to all, you know, along Pico, when by behind the um, the gym and Seventh and Mission. I mean, there's a lot of openings there. So I don't know whether the concern, maybe the discussion, can be further brought out, is the fact that not so much having people then monitor the, the cameras, but actually have somebody being there to run, close it down the periphery so that the entrance in the evening, let's say after five o'clock when or whoever what time whatever time the security the security people leave and you're only left with one on the campus because the one is there then to be able to lock everything out so that you only have one entrance and you still have people you know if you, the community want to come and use it then they just have to run their 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 license through and at least you know who's been there in that evening otherwise we were still in the, in the same boat that so what if we have cameras because people can get in because again our 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 Schools were built for community centers, community centers. So there's always access, you know, parents, other kids, all older siblings, younger siblings coming on. So you, you need to be able to control that piece. And I think that's real crucial for me, especially you, during the time, during time, you know, the daylight savings when it gets dark by about 4.30, 5 o'clock, and, and kids are still there. My kids were still there, and they would get, Mom, where are you coming, you know? They were right away calling me to make sure I was on my way. So that's the only thing is that I don't know whether when you come back, whether you can add that piece in, what would the cost be? Even if we just had one security guard, if we limited um, at Samo just to the 7th and Michigan, and so that everybody goes through there and has to, you know, run it, at least until, let's say, 9 o'clock or whenever, whatever the time we decide we're going to close out the fields. Thank you, Maria. So, Dr. Drotti, I hear um, a very uh, passionate board about this topic of safety. And um, I also heard a majority of the board um, say that we want to um, stick closely to the presentation and to the parameters of what you brought to us tonight. So uh, I think that this is the direction and I, I, I think we're all confident that your staff, that you and your staff can uh, glean the sensibilities of each of us here and as Maria said, our opinions and our thinking here, but there is a consensus on the following points from what I can tell, and I appreciate if my colleagues would make sure that um, I'm mirroring back um, what they said. On the first part of your presentation tonight, Dr. Dreddy, your staff um, identified the, the business about the control ID check-in system and identified two different pilots, one that they believed worked well, one that didn't work so well, and, and articulated the kind of feedback from the users of those two different sites, the one being Lincoln Middle School and the other being Santa Monica High School. I hear the Board of Education tonight overwhelmingly in support of the uh, Raptor-like, uh, presuming it's gonna be Raptor, and the types of uh, protections that it gives. Um, but I would also, so I hear that as being the consensus of this board there on that first part of the presentation tonight and that we should move forward on all of our campuses and look forward to an implementation plan that comes from staff on that account. I also did hear many of the members um, mention questions about privacy and data and I think it goes without, what well, shouldn't go without say, stay, saying, we want to say it often, privacy is a, a top priority for us and we always want to protect the data of our students, our families, our parents, and we trust that you will take that as an overarching direction that whatever we do with regards to an implementation plan, that privacy is a very, very top concern. Um, on the second part, pertaining to the video cameras that would be installed at the perimeters for protection of, um, I think it's also uh, the decision, or student, we haven't made a decision, but it is the direction of the board that we move and, and move in a timely way to identify cameras on the fences and uh, the perimeters of our schools throughout the district. I think you heard um, John say maybe, you know, Samuel High, go now, but others maybe wait, but I don't think that that reflects the will of the board. I think the majority of the board members are in favor of moving forward and looking at what implementation would look like for perimeter uh, monitoring of um, all of our schools. I think we heard that the board needs more information though uh, before there could be a final determination and, and an action item as to what the costs would be. I think many members of the board said we'd like to know what maintenance costs would be, the year two, three, all of that stuff, and I think that you and your staff heard that we need to have that. I think it's a pretty resounding uh, support that we don't want to be surveilling people in, in the interior, and 
We don't like face recognition like on the CIA. We, we don't want to be tracking people in that way, uh, most certainly. But on the two components, if we bifurcate as you have, you, you did, you broke it into two pieces, I think that the board is, a majority of the board is in support and look forward to implementation plans and an action plan coming to us, an action item coming to us in the future. I'm noting that there were some um, abstentions as well, not abstentions, but objections to certain pieces, but I read the majority of the board saying to move forward. Maria? The only other piece and I would add, it, it doesn't have to be necessarily attached to this, par uh, this particular uh, resolution or discussion item. But I think in the future, as you come back and then we add these on, that we, if we can get a, t a total view of all the safety mechanisms, especially at Santa Monica High School in Malibu, to see what is it that we have everything in place. Because my, my concern is still going to be if there's any way that we can have this check-in process go, I, I found out from Ralph that it's sometimes open until 10 o'clock at night, that if we can have somebody there at least check I mean, that's all you need is to make sure to see who's there yeah. and see what the cost of that would be. Just well, that's future. If you have sporting future. events, you have, you have hundreds of people there. Yeah. No. All right. So, uh, everybody, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that I did all right. I'm looking no. to my peers with regards to the direction. Thank you so much. All right. So we're going to let Dr. Drotty bring this home. But before you do, I oh no, I don't. I was going to say one other thing. I was going to do a shout out to another NPR story that I just heard this morning, actually. And do you know, did you know that they can create fences around our phone? They might not know that it's my phone, but they can know, like, whose phone was it at, at an event? Like, this is crazy. So, well, there, no, okay, this is, this is a good question, They The story that I would like to direct people's attention to, because it speaks to some of the concerns that have been mentioned, this is just a side note conversation, is that they're using that kind of data now for political campaigns. Thank you. So it's just fascinating that we're holding these devices that now, for marketing purposes, whether it be political or commercial, someone can tell where I have been for 60 days after I have been there. Dr. Drotty? Yeah. Not so, good. Not good, Dr. Drotty. No, 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 sorry. I didn't mean good for that. <laughs> yes. But um, just, just a few comments here. Ladies um, and gentlemen, dear friends, Dr. Drotty's going to just, just, just a few comments. Um, I think I have the ability to poll you all um, in, in my face-to-face -face meetings with you. Uh, so I'll, I'll be coming to you about ideas of parent engagement. Uh, I'm confident that um, the PT, the families of Samo High have deliberated this because they've been on me about them paying for the cameras. I, I've said no uh, uh, to the PTAs and all that because I said that's a responsibility of the district. But I know they've been pressuring uh, uh, us to give them the ability to actually put cameras up, then that's coming from the families of uh, SAMO. So I know they've deliberated, but I will check with them on what process they actually use, official process they use. But, but in the meantime, I will be coming to you to talk about some ideas, pull you about some ways to engage some of the parents around, around these issues. Because you, you just, you just might, it, can, it, can, it can go wild out there if you're not careful how you, uh, how you have the conversation. And it's, uh, secondly, I want, I want everybody to consider this. This is necessarily f not for you, but just anybody out there that's doubting this. Um, um, anytime you go into a, a, a court or where somewhere we say certain people are important, you go through these checks. You go through cameras, okay? I, I would submit that our students are the most important uh, people out there, and we, it's not something we can just say we can be laissez-faire about. I think Aiden put it the best. He said, you know, truthfully, there is no really nowhere secure on the campus unless you have some, uh, some of these pieces in place. Cameras do this for us. They multiply our eyes. Cameras multiply ours. We don't have enough staffing. We're not funded to have enough security guards to cover every corner. That vast field, backfield at Samo High, okay, I would have to post five, six people back there just to see what's going on for anybody coming in, but a, a single person can cover the whole area with a camera. So those are kind of things we're, we're, we're looking at so we can see uh, where you can, uh, in the front office, we can know where somebody's uh, happening fence or not. So cameras multiply our eyes to be able to, uh, to, be able to see what's happening around us. Uh, so just remember, remember when you go into a courtroom or when you go to some official, when you go into the banks, when you go into all these different people, 
people are protecting themselves through this, but I, I will submit our students are the most important uh, 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 investments that we can protect. Thank you, Dr. Richard, Trotty. Richard, can I, because mm -hmm. I, you know, I was probably the most negative, and I didn't mean to be negative about about it, and you know, support the issue, and we talk about presentation sometimes, and so I, I, I'm a, I'd rather always fall on the fall on the side of providing us more information. If we don't need it, that's great, but you know, I'd, if there's, as John said, there's there's been you know, there's a study, there's there's stuff, there's there's. Um, maps already prepared about where cameras may be. It helps, at least me, understand the scope of what we're doing and when we're talking about, you know, spending m millions of dollars over a period of time. Um, we want to know, you know, it, it's my responsibility to know what the, in detail um, what it is that we're being asked to, you know, to move forward with. And, you know, that's really the base of it because that just helps do it. And I think we all are, you, you all both summed it up greatly. Thank you so much for that. And, and, you know, I know the proper stuff will come back next time. And, Ralph, your comments are most appreciated in the, in the evening yeah. because I think that, um, and I want to make, I think that the entire board concurs and would echo that. I mean, the, the benefit of our Friday memo, um, some of us like more detail than others on a variety of different issues. But, I mean, don't be afraid to drop in our laps, please, you know, where exactly the cameras will be and how they will be, you know, all of that. And our Friday memo and, and distributing that to the Board of Education, I think, is good. And I, I just wanted to echo what Ralph just said. Don't be afraid to, to provide that information to us. We do look forward to the action item that will be coming forward. I'd like to move on. Can I, I just want to say one more thing, though. Yes. I, I hope that nobody construes Ralph's comments. I'm looking at you guys to say we want longer, more deep, full presentations. The goal would be ad appendices with lots of data that we can look at if we need them, but thank you. Just thank you, thank you for that too. <laughs> this is great. Dear friends, we now move to major action items. Mm -hmm. Item number 9A, which is the adoption of resolution 1832, establishing citizens, that's over, uh, more than one, citizens oversight committees and adopting bylaws relating thereto. Carrie, and Gary, forgive me, I meant to thank you also on behalf of the board. Thank you to your staff. Thank you. And I see who is presenting this resolution. Okay, welcome, 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 Ms. Kennedy. I don't necessarily have a presentation for you. It should be fairly quickly, or quick, I'm not speaking proper English. Um, as we all know, um, SMS and Measure M both passed, and one of the, the, the pieces that we've actually put in front of you is resolutions to um, um, start an oversight committee, or citizens oversight committee, for uh, Measure M separately, and then to place SMS within our measure E and, and BB. Um, so that is what is actually in front of you at this moment for um, approval on, on that. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? Moved by Craig, seconded by Ralph. Thank you so much. This is a roll call vote. Mr. Metcher? Yes. Ms. Leon Vasquez? Yes. Ms. Lieberman? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Mr. De La Torre? Yes. Mr. Keene? Yes. And I'm also yes. Sarah, that's a unanimous vote of the Board of Education on item 9A, the adoption of resolution 1832, establishing citizens oversight committees and adopting bylaws related thereto. Uh, we, on item 9B, we have three public speakers. Uh, this is a letter to be sent. The, we want to authorize a letter to be sent to the California Coastal Commission supporting the multipurpose field at the Santa Monica Civic Center. And um, uh, we would like to, as board leadership, to present this letter and to let our peers know that we would like to take a vote this evening and give direction to the superintendent to submit a letter to the Coastal Commission in advance of the March 6th meeting where the, uh, the field will be before them. And we would also, I would just say, as a matter of privilege, encourage anyone who could join and going to the Coastal Commission to advocate for this. And the letter does, I think, nicely articulate, I think, what we have said over time as a Board of Education. We do have um, three speakers.
perhaps we could have entertain a motion first and then go to the speakers and then have discussion. It's moved by Oscar, seconded by Ralph, and that'll bring us now to the public speakers. Speakers who have submitted a public speaking card prior to the beginning of this item will have three minutes to speak. Speakers who submit a public speaking card after the board begins comments shall be allowed one minute to speak. Speakers and members of the audience are asked to refrain from expressions of support or disagreement that would intimidate other speakers or disrupt the meeting. We have three public speakers for this item. They will each have three minutes. They're Ann Hoover, Jolly Mamita, and Ann Thanawala. Welcome and thank you for your patience this evening. Oh my goodness, it's been fascinating. And listen, I won't take the three minutes. Um, just for the record, my name's Ann Hoover. I'm a Samo High parent, co-chair of um, our PTSA Civic Center Task Force. And we're really just here tonight to say a very heartfelt thank you to you all for your support for so long now on this. It's not a real field yet, but with your efforts, you know, it's getting closer and closer and we're so excited. We think the letter's terrific. We also love that it mentions, you know, synergies for the field with the other uses within that area too. We, we hope to see this be a real community space, um, especially when the auditorium gets added down the line. So just very heartfelt thanks from Samo High PTSA and me permanently. It's gonna be a great field for our district and our high school and our community. Good evening. Hi, Joali Mamita. Um, the same thing that Ann said, we are here right now to thank you for all the support during last couple of years, and we've been in this for five, six years, but the community were fighting for this for 20 years. So now we're getting so, so close. This is like March 6th, it would be our last challenge, and, and we are very positive that it's gonna happen. We get the last stage, and that's it. August, we have some news that August might be the time that we're going to actually start the construction in the field in Civic Center. So. Thank you very much for you and, and community, everybody who were uh, involved with this um, processes and, and help us. Thank you very much. Hello, Ann Thanawala. Um, field cannot be built fast enough. We all know that. We're all really excited to see it built. Um, we did have a question about process. Um, and with this letter particularly, uh, we would like it explained to the public how, um, when, when the discussion of, when, when the board had a discussion about the lab school in order to include that in the letter, because we don't believe there was ever discussion, public discussion on that issue. So that would be something we'd like to hear about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to take a roll call vote, if that's possible, and after the discussion, yes. Oscar? I just, uh, I, think, I think because the, um, I mean, the point that was just made by the last speaker, in looking at the letter, the, um, I, 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 think, I think it would be better if we just focused on the, on the uh, field, being that, that the, uh, the issue of the, um, the uh, early uh, childhood lab school has already been approved and it's already, from from what I've seen, is already being, uh, in, it's already in construction. So I don't know. I don't know if we need to sort of muddy up this uh, this letter by adding something that's already been approved and it's already uh, already uh, being constructed. And we can just focus on the field. I think it just it adds a lot more power to to our letter. And I I would I would move that that we would strike that that last sentence out um, so that it just focuses on the field because it's pretty simple if we would just eliminate that. Is there a second? The motion dies without a second. Is there further discussion? Lori? I just, I actually just want to respond, Oscar, by saying that I think actually the point, the intent of that was actually captured by um, Ann Hoover when she spoke of talking about the synergy. And if anything, I think I would add to that, I can't bring it up, unfortunately, right this minute. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think we should edit it at the dais, but I don't have any issue with adding something about um, the other uses, the, the auditorium use as well, because I think the point of that was to say that the field is compatible with the other uses that exist or ha are 
coming into existence because they've already been approved. It is, has nothing to do with whether we approved them, supported them or not. The auditorium already exists there, and the Early Childhood Lab School has already um, been approved by the Coastal Commission. And I think the point was about synergy and, to, in, if anything, to sort of um, fend off concerns of that it was a that it's a um, battle between these uses with each other, um, and, and that that may not reflect the point of view of this, the entire school board. So maybe we should talk about that. That that's just my view. <laughs> but are there any other are there any other comments? What because. Oscar made the original motion, so I don't know if he still oh. stands by the no, original motion. No, it failed. It has no the, second. Oh, oh, oh. No, he made the original made motion. He made the original oh. motion, not, not the so addition to you still want to be the maker of the original motion? I was just con I was just concerned that we, we're creating controversy when we don't need it. You know what I'm saying? And we want, I mean, we're very clear on, on what we're trying to accomplish here is to support the field. And I think the whole community has been behind all that. So I just didn't want to just create more controversy when we don't need it. But I understand what what uh, Board Member Lieberman just stated, that there's other uses and all that, but we just singled out one of them, and if, it would have been great to see sort of the other, the, the vision for that, because yeah. to be honest, uh, I never really, I don't remember engaging in a discussion, you know, in terms of the early childhood lab school um, uh, on the dais. Like, I don't think we ever had that discussion on the board. Maybe some board members were involved in that, but I, I just don't recall Can, having I, that for, Friends, excuse me, my colleagues, uh, this is an action item, not a discussion item, so I do want to I can call the question, well, though. No, no, no. Can, there, I, well, can I just ask you? We can't discuss things no, on an action No, no, you can't. I, I just, <laughs> I don't think we can. We're in the middle of a motion where there was a point of question from one of our peers asking whether or not Oscar wants to remain the maker of the motion. So I want, but I want to first I didn't get clarity from him, so that's what I'm just saying. Before I want to ask him, do you want to remain the mover of the letter as it reads, Oscar? Yes. Thank you. So what I'm going to say is that there is a motion on the floor. It's been moved by Oscar, seconded by Ralph, to approve the letter as it is written before us. Shall we take this to a vote? Uh, I'm thinking of making a substitute motion. <laughs> I'd just like to make a substitute motion that since the letter that, that Dr. Drotty and Sarah edit the letter to include um, with the other use at that site, which is the Civic Auditorium, so that it's about compatibility with all of them. I don't think it's necessary whether we debate whether each of us thinks the Civic Auditorium should stay or not, it's staying. Or about the Early Childhood Lab School, whether it should be or not, because it's already been approved. Thank so you. Is there a second to that motion? Thank you. It's been seconded by John Keene. That is now the perfected motion. Or the uh, so now we'll move, seeing no objection. Do you have that, Sarah? Sarah has it, which is great. Mr. Metcher? Yes. Ms. Leon Vasquez? Yes. Ms. Lieberman? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Mr. De La Torre? Yes. Mr. Keene? Yes. And I'm a yes. That is unanimous decision of the Board of Education. Go field. This is great. Thank you so much for those of you who came out and spoke to this this evening. And we have one last major action item, colleagues. That is the CSBA Delegate Assembly election. <laughs> Craig is... Everybody had some muddied, um, convoluted, not convoluted, but less clear reason to run than one person, and I don't know that I'm going to be able to create it here because my I'm having computer problems too. But but there was one person who said I want to run to work with CSBA to work to, with the state, thank you, uh, on um, enhanced funding for the California schools. And for me, that was the person who um, worked for me. I am not going to remember their name. I think it was Sandoval or, Sandoval, is, yeah. is it? Um, John, is there some way I can get to the bios below just to confirm that i hate to vote for the wrong person just because i thought i remembered it right uh, we can but vote for, uh, no more than six candidates right oh really uh, yeah, we can, can we vote six, six times for him or her 
No? Oh, all right. Can we bullet vote? Can we just vote? Oh, but that doesn't help us because... No, I guess that bullet votes helps us. Um, Because that struck me, because to me, that's the far and away the biggest issue, you know. Maria says she also has some names that she'd like to recommend. So I I hear that um, we have one name to be considered recommendation from Member Foster, and I think also Member De La Torre. Um, So I'll take that as as a move and a second on the one. Is that okay? On the Sandoval, should we take them individually? But it might be easier to do. Do them all together? Okay. My, my recommendation does include her anyway. Because I was looking, you know, part of it in, in these, these assembly, you know, as a delegate, I mean, you run the gamut on it, whether people are informed or whatever. And to be honest, quite honestly, I don't know how much gets done on these anyway, to be honest with you. So anyway, here it goes. Um, I was thinking, let's go with one, two, there's three that are already, what do you call it, uh, incumbents. And then I was dividing it in regions so that haven't been, um, that haven't. And one of them was uh, Sandoval because she's Little Lake City School District. The other one was, um, because there was already a Compton, the La Mirada and then the ABC Unified School District. So you have um, Adams, Baird, um, Nishi, Sandoval, um, who's the other one? Tirado, and then Zurita. And those would be the six. So they're just regionally, they cover the whole gamut of the county. That's all for us. In our district, I reach in 24. Craig and Oscar, are you okay with that since there was a motion? So can I just pretend that was your motion, all three of you? We'll have a first, second, and third. I'm sorry. Where in Robert's rules pretend. <laughs> does pretend? I'm going to never live that one down. It's not even 9 o'clock, so I can't claim the late hour. So it's not that. But it's, yes, this is good. But we have it, right? So it, it just, we, we've identified. I second the motion to pretend that Thank that you. was Oscar's <laughs> original you. motion. Thank you, Craig. It's a friendly amendment. We'll go to a roll call vote. Mr. Metcher. Yes. Ms. Leon Vasquez. Yes. Ms. Lieberman. Yes. Mr. Foster. Yes. Mr. De La Torre. Yes. Mr. Keene. Yes. I'm also yes. So that's unanimous vote for six of the candidates as, um, is it six? I think it was six, right? There. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, colleagues, we now move to general public comments, and we have several. We have two. We have two, we have two A general couple. comments. There were two chits that came in for information items, but we do not take comments for information items. So those can be addressed through general comments. Uh, public comment is a time when members of the audience may address the Board of Education on items not scheduled on the meeting's agenda. Pursuant to the Brown Act, board members may not engage in discussion of issues raised during public comments except to ask clarifying questions, make a brief announcement, make a brief report on his or her own activities, or to refer the matter to staff. Public comment section shall be limited to 30 minutes. Speakers who have submitted a public speaking card prior to the beginning of the section will have three minutes to speak. Finally, speakers and members of the audience are asked to refrain from expressions of support or disagreement that would intimidate other speakers or disrupt the meeting. Our speakers are Lydia Moraro and Ann Thanawala. We'll each have three minutes. Hello again. Okay, so with the school facilities use, um, we just want the, the board to be aware of some issues that have come up where our kids would like to use our facilities, particularly at Sam High, more frequently. We had this discussion last night at VAPA, um, and, and um, that aren't on the schedule. So what ends up happening, happening is that they end up having to pay for those additional staff members. And we understand from Carrie, who had given us a presentation last night, that you know we're kind of at a, a running a little bit in the red because JAMS facility is uh, not operable. So we're not able to uh, open that up to the community for use and those revenues that come along with it. Um, so we're, we, we want the board to recognize the fact that our kids would like more use of our own facilities on, on campus at Sam High, Barnum Hall. Um, and, and when that comes, we'd, we'd kind of like you guys to, to pony up some money for that. Um, and maybe it's only for two or three years until JAMS comes back online 
and and that money the revenue from the community comes back um, but we just want to put that out there because our kids would like to do more and and I mean who wouldn't love them to do that um, but you know money's an issue so you know for the staff that that goes along with uh, renting those facilities that haven't been on the calendar um, we hope there's a proposal coming forth to you guys to say hey would you be willing to cover those costs so it so we don't have to look elsewhere for facilities okay um, we shouldn't have to because there are kids and it's our campus right so um, I just wanted to bring that up thank you good evening I'll clarify a little bit what Anne just said um, it's not so much that the kids want to do more is that um, in music in choir band and orchestra uh, the burden is solely on the parents to run those programs and to raise money for these programs. Um, it takes over a hundred grand to run band at Samo High, for example. And um, every dollar that we pay um, to have the use of a facility, we understand we don't pay for the facility itself, but for the personnel to run the facility, is directly taken away from the money we raised uh, for the program and that goes towards the music education of the children. Um, to this extent, to give you an example, Jazz Band is an after-school program. So if Jazz Band wants to use Barnum Hall to have its winter concert, which is a scheduled concert, but because it's an after-school program, Jazz Band has to pay $1,200 to Samo High, I mean to Barnum, to have this two-hour concert for which we'll raise grand total of three grand with tickets or something. And so then we have to pay this 1200. So only, you know, that much money will go towards the program. So while we have the benefits of having our facilities as a partner uh, for the uh, curriculum concerts, um, because we are forced to raise that much money, we would like to have additional tools to do that, and we would like to see our facilities be a partner in that. Again, we understand that the money is gonna have to come from somewhere, but um, we feel it's important. There he's here, I, I know that. <laughs> yeah. It's not a coincidence. <laughs> um, so that's that about the facilities. Uh, I have something else to say in the public comments about something else, but do I come back for that? This is it. Okay, so some will get ahead. Um, access, equal access for all students to um, make a hole in their schedule so that they can take VAPA disciplines and a language. Um, there is a strong inequity in some way to get ahead because we don't have enough space for incoming ninth graders. Um, and, um, um, oops. Um, sorry. Um, I guess that's that. Not enough space. That's it. Um, I'll do it. So, uh, can I ask uh, Carrie if you're prepared to speak to, or if not, can you put in our Friday packet? Um, I think a number of us, huh? Yeah, I mean, if you have anything to say. A, a number of us are surprised to hear that a school activity would be charged a facility fee to use a school facility. So, I, and you look perplexed as well. So uh, you don't need, I, mean, I don't want to put you on the spot. If you want to go away, look at it, think about it, maybe even check back with them and, come and just put something in the packet for us, please. Uh, what I can say is the only, the only event I needed to check on is the jazz concert and why they were charged a personnel rate. Uh, what we do and what our, our procedure has been is that for all curricular concerts, uh, all curricular events, uh, those are fully supported either by facility use or by the school site for personnel cost. For fundraisers and uh, those types of additional events, they are charged for the extra, extra personnel cost. They're not charged for facilities or anything, but they're charged for where we have to bring in extra security officers, technicians, 
uh, uh, custodians to support those. And that's true of also PTA events, Ed Foundation events. And, and, and in this case, that would $1,200 is, seems like an accurate- $1,200 for running Barnum for a night for a full concert is pretty much what it cost for two additional security, one to two additional custodians, one to two additional uh, technicians, and a uh, audi audi audience services person. Thank you, Kerry. Yeah, thank you. Okay. John, I mean, I'm sorry. Richard, I must have a, com a comment related to the information item. Yes. To, before you stop. It was related, it's related to the use of school facilities. Um, and I'm just asking when this was bef before here the last time for discussion, I think there were two things that were agreed would come back to us at some point. It's not here. One, one being a sort of a, a financial review of, of the program um, because it, you know, its costs and benefits and all. And, um, and I think there were, you know, comments about um, taking another look at some point in the, in the near future about how to further even, you know, change some of the fee structure to um, ensure, you know, to try to help out. This would be a case of uh, other, you know, for commercial events to bear the burden of paying the cost for some of our community events. This Thank would you. be a classic case of that. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, that brings us to board member comments. I have one, and then I know John does. I just wanted to, re and Oscar, can I, we just go in the row, is that okay? I just want to let everyone know that um, John and I have taken uh, to the road as the chair and vice chair um, to talk about PBL, um, and particularly the ninth grade pathway when we've been invited by a school's PTA. We visited with Grant Elementary School, and just this morning we were at Franklin. We were also invited by the uh, Mecha Student Steering Committee uh, of uh, Olympic High School and Santa Monica High School, and John and I met with them to talk about um, some of their concerns about Olympic particularly um, as we look at our PBL project in the district and we hope to be invited to other um, elementary schools as well to talk about um, the project. And of course, we all know that we have a special meeting on Tuesday. John and then Oscar. Okay. Yeah, I hope I'm doing this at the right time because this is where I always make procedural mistakes, but in an evening where we had an imaginary motion approved, I think I'm pretend. pretend. So this is, this is more a request for staff or a, a Imaginary motions are a whole different. Okay. So I have been spending some time talking with parents there's been a renewed interest from parents after the two pilots at SAMO for looking at later start times um, I think that moving forward for next year there will not be a change in start times they're not going to be moving earlier which is what people want to hear but I would love it if in the time we have in the next six to nine months maybe we as a district could take a look at what flexibility we have with start times what programs would be impacted what that would do to travel what it would do to tra the transportation what what we could do what options we have in terms of uh, in terms of later start times across our district i think our community would like to hear that i'd like to hear that and uh, i think now's a good time to do it that it's in the in the public framework thank you john oscar yeah i'm glad that uh you mentioned um, that but both of those items are really important because that's what i'm hearing a lot in the community one other one and i think um, uh, it's important for all of us is the issue of uh, math and and how we're um, serving our students um, in, in our math program programming and, and, and offerings and courses and I mean it's a, it's a big issue so I'm what I'd like to propose at some point is that we create a task force to look into math in general um, it, it could be I, I just I've just been on the board for so long and I've seen that that is one area that we we are not doing as well consistently and, and uh, if we, we 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 need we need something bigger than just a report we need I think we need a, a task force of sorts so I just want to propose that Thank you, Oscar. Are there other board comments? Maria. I just wanted to comment with Board Member Foster. Thank you, because in your comments, you, you're bringing into my favorite word, college and career readiness. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. And as we move to adjourn tonight's meeting, Dr. Drotti, I want to say again, thank you to you and your staff and the good work that you do for our district. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to adjourn? Moved by Oscar and Craig. All in favor, say aye. aye. 
and we're out. We'll see each other on Tuesday. Four o'clock.